Center on July 22nd at 7.35 p.m. Let's all stand and say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this point, I don't believe that there's any changes to the agenda. So we can move on to um, approval of minutes. I'll entertain a motion to approve the June 23rd, 2020 me meeting minutes. So moved. Karen Moran. Jacob Murray, second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. <laughs> discussion. All opposed, say nay. So I'll start with myself, Chris Plord. Aye. Tony. Aye. Jacob. Aye. Dana. Aye. Rini. Aye. Karen. Aye. Kate. Aye. All in favor, motion passes. I'll entertain a motion to approve the June 24th, 2020 meeting minutes. Jacob Murray, I move that we approve the June 24th special meeting mini minutes. Tony Holt, second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Opposed, say nay. I'll start with myself, Christina Plord, aye. Tony? Aye. Jacob? Aye. Dana? Aye. Rainey? Aye. Karen? Aye. Kate? Aye. Motion passes. I'll entertain a motion to approve the July 8th, 2020 minutes. Jacob Mari, I motion that we approve the July 8th meeting minutes. Tony Holt, second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. Chris, uh, Christina Plord, aye. Tony? Aye. Jacob? Aye. Dana? Aye. Rini? Aye. Karen? Aye. Kate? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, so now we're on to public participation. At this time, I'll invite the public to come up and raise your little blue hand in the right of the screen. Or I believe um, if you're on the phone, star nine, is that correct, Walt? That is correct, star nine, yes. Okay, and if board members could lower their hands at this time. Okay. First up, we have Kate Vallo. Hi there, Kate Vallow, Amy Tall and Green. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as you know, Tallins, like all communities, has struggled to find its feet during this pandemic. Dr. Willett has managed to stay grounded, move the district forward, and remain accessible to the community, all while demonstrating strong leadership. From his efforts to keep the school's technology up to date, while also managing communications behind the scenes, to his responsiveness to board members and community members alike, to his compassion in action, Dr. Willett not only seems to be able to do it all, he does his job well. Dr. Willett, you are highly regarded, respected, and valued by so many of my friends and neighbors, and we thank you for your unwavering commitment to this community. You continue to lead us through facing so many challenges from crumbling foundations to unexpected closures to looking forward to an unprecedented way of moving, of providing education this fall, and you somehow do it while making room for all perspectives, truly listening and being respectful and kind. Your steady support of the community is deeply appreciated, and I hope that the board responds in kind to you, not only supporting you, but also following your lead. To the board, these are trying times, and your volunteer efforts are truly appreciated. I'm sure I'm not alone in looking to you to provide the same kind of steady leadership that our superintendent provides. I hope that you'll prioritize working together with him and each other in a positive and constructive way to lead our community forward through these next challenging steps. 
Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Michelle? Michelle Harold? Hi, uh, Michelle Harold, 256 Mountain Spring Road. And um, I want to echo kind of what Kate said. Um, <coughs> I know uh, you're in the review process, and I'm not sure where exactly that process is right now, but I know how hard the superintendent works. And I was just on the, um, the, the website for returning to school, and I cannot believe how informative it is. And I know that Dr. Willett does that all himself on top of all of his other duties. So I appreciate the efforts, and I know people I talk to do also. So I hope your review goes well and um, that your efforts and what everything you do and leading with compassion comes through in your, um, your review. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Next up is Colleen. Colleen, you're on mute. We go. Can you hear me, Christina? Yes, we can. Right. Sorry, sorry about that. Tony, I like your new uh, hairstyle or something's different. You're looking good. Um, Colleen, you to check 12 Blueberry Hill, um, Tallinn, Connecticut. Um, I've been following along and I haven't been at meetings or listening to you guys, but you're all doing a terrific job and a really tough time. But I also want to um, add some kind comments for Dr. Willett as well. Um, he has worked tirelessly only for the um, goodness of our students and staff. He's been in the midst of building a new school, working through a pandemic, um, trying to figure out how to reopen the school safely um, for everybody involved. I'll just try and keep it short. Um, since the new board has taken over, there's been three new committees formed, which means an additional amount of work that he already had and he also still serves as our curriculum director. Um, so I just want to thank you, Dr. Willett, and I hope the board appreciates you as much as I believe a lot of people in our community do. Um, and they enjoy working with you over the past five years. But I do also have a couple of questions. <laughs> you can answer uh, points of information. Um, I'm just wondering, um, what is the district doing for the high risk children of our schools. I've listened to many meetings, but yet haven't heard too much um, what that model could look like. I have a very high risk child, so I am one of those that are on the fence right now. And um, how special ed kids would be, still be able to be integrated into the classrooms um, if you're gonna try and make the model smaller. I'm not sure. Making that clear, or if you know what I'm trying to say, <laughs> I just think it's going to look different for some students, and I'm just concerned about that. 30 seconds. Thanks, Tony. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. Thank you. Next up is Bethany Lesko. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Very good. You had that right. Bethany Lesko, 26 Deer Meadow. Um, thank you for that. I just wanted to commend Dr. Willett for his diligent, unwavering dedication to Tallinn Tal Public Schools. Although I have not followed through with the Board of Ed uh, proceedings diligently, but offered my support to Tallinn schools in other ways, what I have not faltered on is the dedication Dr. Willett has shown us. He has done an exemplary job of leading Tallinn Public Schools, and I truly hope the review by the Board shows the respect that he has shown our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Kate, is your hand up again, or did you forget to take it down? Um, sorry, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we will move on to points of information. Um, I'd just like to say thanks to say thanks to everyone that got up to speak. Um, and, and give Dr. Willett uh, their thanks. Uh, he's done a great job through this, and I think that will be reflected in the review process. Uh, and to answer Colleen's question, I think I'll hand that over to Dr. Willett, but hopefully some of that is answered in the, the plan that he's going to present tonight. Um, and if there's still any concerns after that, Colleen, I think definitely we should talk one-on-one -on -one or, or schedule an appointment with Dr. Willett and 
you know, get some of those concerns addressed. Yes, so I just I first want to say I'm humbled by uh, all the kindness and I deeply appreciate all the comments that were made. Um, so thank you. I can't tell you how much it, it, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to to come out and say those things tonight. Um, and for uh, Ms. Yudicek, um, you know, I uh, right now uh, the districts across the state are in the process of determining really exactly that question. Um, I know that in talking with Patty Hess, who is the Director of Pupil Services and um, Wendy Cody, who's the supervisor for uh, Pupil Services, that this is the utmost in their mind. Um, and in the document I'm going to talk about tonight, some of that information is available um, and more will become available as the state of Connecticut provides additional guidance over the next few weeks. Um, but uh, I know that the educators, uh, the teachers, um, you know, and all the staff are, are very focused on making sure that um, students in any kind of high risk category or any in elevated category of risk are going to be well taken care of. Uh, attention will be given to them. Um, and as the situation evolves in Connecticut, you know, if we were to go into a certain kind of um, closure condition, um, it may be that students in certain populations would still be in school. Um, even though other populations are out because a lot of times uh, students that, um, you know, that have exceptionalities may need that one-to-one -one support or in-person support in a way that, um, that other students don't necessarily need it. So uh, some of the plans I've seen from the state of Connecticut um, you know, we'll have responses that are meant for the majority of the kids, but that they, they will be looking to the schools to provide safe environments um, that, uh, that may be for certain special populations. So there's many different things that will be coming out in the next few weeks. Um, but we do take that responsibility very, very seriously. Um, you know, and we will make sure that, uh, that whatever the district does, that it's in the best interest of children and it falls in the guidelines and directives of the state of Connecticut. So um, I'd be happy to talk more about you with that, uh, more about it with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I know the uh, pupil services director, Patty Hess, would be able to help a lot, and so would Ms. Cody. Um, so what, whichever direction you want to go, uh, we'll make sure that we touch base with you so that we can address any concerns you have. And also have those superintendent virtual coffees that are listed on the uh, newsletters and happy to also talk about it in any of those environments as well. Thank you. And I think I saw Karen's hand up. Yes, um, I just have a point of procedure. I wanted to ask uh, how we're going to deal with folks um, wanting to get back into the meeting after executive session. I, I guess we could. I mean, technically, we're supposed to open open it back up after executive session. I just don't know what that looks like. Do they go into a waiting room or something if they're still hanging around or? You know, what you could do, Ms. Plord, um, if I may offer, you could move or make a motion to move the executive session to the absolute last part of the agenda so that there is nothing else to cover after it. Okay. So I will entertain a motion to move item K, executive session, down to O, under new business. So moved. Karen Moran. Tony Holt, second. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor, say no, aye. No, hold on, hold on. Um, I'm not really sure if that's, that's um, the best idea. I think people probably want to know, um, you know, if there's something that happens during executive session when we come back out in, uh, come back out into public session. So I don't know if that's really what is best. So another alternative would be I could um, send out another blast at the time that we exit ex executive session saying if people wanted to log in at this time, um, the board is going back into regular session and, uh, you know, and put a time five minutes north of the time that I send the email. I can do that as part of an all school blast if, if desired. 
we want to, since there's a motion on the table, we'll, we'll take a vote. And if it fails, then we can go with that suggestion. How about that? Sure. All right, so anyone in favor, say aye. Anyone opposed, say nay. I'll start with myself, Christina Plord, aye. <laughs> Tony? Nay. Jacob? Uh, aye. Dana? Nay. Rini? Aye. Karen? Nay. Kate? Nay. So the motion fails. So back to the drawing board. So what? So I could. This is. I'm sorry. This is Dana Feldman. I'd like to make a motion um, to have Dr. Willett send out communication, um, advising that we're out of executive session, so public can come back into our zoom this evening i don't know if that's the correct motion <laughs> <laughs> i don't think we need i don't think we need the motion i think um, when we come out of executive session since we are in you know if they're in the waiting room if people want to wait in the waiting room they can stay there and when we're done we can let them back in or you could send out uh, an additional communication do we have Does to that ask for everyone do we have to ask dr willett to do that through through procedure yeah, um, you know, I um, at this time I, we have more people joining this meeting than I've ever seen before. So um, we're getting north of 176 right now. We have a max of 500 that I set uh, this afternoon. I um, I would say that I can do this however you you want, but I'm not. And frankly, I'm not totally sure. There's so many members; it might take me a while to get everybody exited to a waiting room. So I don't, if we, you know, if we want to end it uh, or go into executive session and ask that people come out, um, then, and then as people join back in, if they want to join back in right away, they'll automatically go into Good the save. Way. So that could be the way that we will ultimately handle that. Um, that it, when we go into executive session, we kind of end it, have people come out and then we would, uh, we'd put them back in. Okay. So I think that's a good idea. We'll leave um, the agenda as is, uh, and just note, um, just a note to the public, par public participation, the second public participation will be after executive session, and that may be late. Okay. Any other additional points of information? Oh, Tony, I see your hand. Yeah, so I just wanted to take a minute to, to thank everybody that's been sending in emails uh, I know we have a plethora of things going on and covering a wide range of topics. And, you know, we've had some, some really good and informative email traffic coming through. And, you know, I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chase, are you in the shower? Well, can you can come you out here? Mute all lines. Oh, Christina. Okay, so now we just have to unmute ourselves. Yeah. So, Christina. Yes. Okay, you all set? Yes. Okay. All right. Tony, you're all set. Uh, Karen, is your hand still up or is it up again? It's up again, sorry. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, I was just going to make a just a short suggestion. Um, um, and Christina, don't take this the wrong way. I just, when you say things about um, people talking to you one on one about something that involves school operations, especially in reopening for students in specific populations. I feel like that communication should really happen between Dr. Willett and his staff and not one-on-one -on -one between a board member um, and a resident. I mean, we all have our conversations, I get it, but if you're gonna pose that, I just don't think it's appropriate. Okay, fair enough. 
Uh, thank you for the feedback, um, but I'll let the public know that my door is always open and you are welcome to call me anytime about anything. Absolutely. All right. Um, if there are no additional points of information, we'll move on to student representatives report. Alexandra and Simmer, are you guys on? Um, so I guess I'll go first. Um, AP scores came out on July 15th, and given the circumstances under which we took them, students actually did a really good job. For um, AP English 4, it was one of the highest scores we've ever gotten. Thank you. Uh, nice job. You guys did congrats. congrats, everybody. That's that's huge. Uh, we don't have much today, but uh, Simmer and I had our orientation meeting with Dr. Will and Mr. Holt last week. We're all up to speed on everything now, and we're excited to continue the year as student representatives. Awesome. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Uh, first item is the continuity of learning plan. Okay, so um, essentially the uh, the pandemic continuity of learning plan for the Tallinn Public Schools um, is due to the state of Connecticut on Friday. Um, so they put out to all a uh, 50-page document and some subordinate documents that laid out some guidelines um, at the end of July or just the very end of July um, and set the 24th as a date for districts to submit plans. The state of Connecticut is not going to accept or reject plans. Um, the purpose of it is to get school systems in alignment and to get them thinking and setting up a process for how they're going to handle uh, schooling as they come back into to, um, the fall. So uh, the state of Connecticut also laid out some very, very clear directives, um, not only in the document, but also to superintendents um, and to me personally every time I ask, um, stating that uh, we are expected as school districts to provide 177 days um, of instruction on 900 hours and that this must occur in person five days a week uh, for all students. Uh, they also provide for students, um, for parent guardians who wish to have their children take um, online versions of schooling. Uh, those school districts in Connecticut must also provide an online learning program uh, for those students. And the state of Connecticut has made a very clear expectation that that online learning would be a synchronous model of online learning. Um, and that uh, school districts uh, should have and should put a lot of thought into evolving uh, the offerings that they provided in the March, April, May, and June period of last year when uh, this was a, a surprise. So there's a higher expectation uh, of the quality of online learning for all districts in Connecticut, um, and that too has been communicated from the state. The state has put out a number of resources, um, including um, a, state, um, a state lab resource and a series of sites that the state has set up, uh, K-12 curriculum for uh, social emotional learning and many other things. Um, and a lot of that information is available on the Tolland uh, Reopening Advisory Committee site. So what we're going to be looking at tonight is the um, Board of Education draft release of our um, pandemic continuity of learning plan. Uh, so when the board meeting is over tonight, I'll continue to make a couple of quick uh, cleanup modifications, and then I'll be posting this draft um, on the superintendent's area of the Board of Education website. Um, but there is uh, just giving an asterisk to its posting that the document is still going to be um, finalized and evolved over the next two days. So what is being presented tonight or provided tonight and what is going to ultimately be uh, sent to the state of Connecticut on Friday um, is going to be updated. So from tonight's presentation to Friday, there will be um, kind of a sweep of the document to clean it up and provide more updates. This document tonight is simply providing the Board of Ed uh, the most recent draft. If something changes in terms of direction from the state of Connecticut over the next 24 to 48 hours, um, the document will be updated accordingly as well. So, um, so right now, uh, what I'd like to do is just share the screen. So give me a moment to, and there's still people coming in, I'm noticing. So I'm uh, just managing that too. But I'm going to share the document to, um, to, the, um, to the Zoom screen here, and um, I will walk you through it. 
and then after the um, we've walked through the document, I will uh, I will take any questions that you have, and uh, we can go from there. So right now, I'm just going to get this shared. Um, okay, it will take me one minute. Share. And if everything went correctly, the little screen will pop up and you should be able to see this, this document. So uh, just taking a look. All right, so if I may ask, um, any one of the board members want to confirm, do you see this document? Just so I'm sure everybody's on the same page. Yes. Looking at some nods, okay. All right, so starting um, starting off, and I can go into as much or as little detail as, uh, as is desired. Um, what I'm going to do is do a fairly brief walk through this. Um, as you can see, there's a number of pages to this. There's 77 pages to the document. People can look at it in as much or as little detail as possible. There are disaggregations of information down to the school level, um, and there's also kind of the helicopter view for those who, you know, who don't know necessarily want to go all the way into the granular level. So um, if you take a quick look at, well, first of all, the first page, it's updated through today. It's the Board of Ed draft release. A state submission version will be provided to the community on July 24th. Um, and even when the state submission is done, I expect that there'll be changes from the state and the document will be uh, accordingly you know, updated all the way through the end of July and into August. So the first uh, page here is the table of contents. Um, it's got in it a number of different things from the superintendent's message to the community, to the rationale for online learning, different calendar drafts, um, the pandemic continuity of learning plan, core priorities, state of Connecticut guidelines, expectations of the students and adults, personal protective equipment, um, the, the pandemic continuity of learning plan committees that have been working on it, the pandemic response conditions um, and various aspects of the in-person plans, transportation, ventilation, um, all educational alternatives available to parents and guardians, what kind of monitoring and nursing expectations we have as well as protocols, and then a brief summary after which there is a uh, there are all of the school operations plans um, and programs listed as well as the appendices that include a lot of information that uh, people may be interested in looking at, including the CIAC sports considerations up to today. So um, the document is pretty extensive. It's got hopefully all the information in it that we could possibly have put in in the timeline we had. Um, and I, I do want to keep emphasizing that um, this document's not done, that uh, the teams that are working on it, uh, the Tolland Reopening Advisory Committee, which is the community's um, you know, feedback basically loop and that committee has been providing great feedback um, and the reopening operations and curriculum teams, which are more than 40 staff working on this as well. We'll be continuing to work on it through through July and into August. Meet, but... Chase! Through July and into August as um, those kinds of things, you know, as we uh, continue to update um, and as the state continues to update um, the information that it's, um, that it's, provide, you know, requiring of us and uh, and the directives that the state is giving, because we do expect um, the state to continue to give us more and more um, updates and directives and uh, for things to change a bit uh, throughout the end of July and into the month of August. Um, Ms. Plord, um, you may want to unmute yourself at some point. I just wanted to let you know that you're muted. Um, and um, occasionally, um, Right now, while we're in this meeting, if I do hear extraneous sounds, I will apply a mute to everyone. Um, and again, uh, for anyone listening right now, please make sure that you are on mute um, so that uh, just some things don't get, you know, kind of strange with the audio. Thank you. We deeply appreciate that. So uh, moving into the sections. Um, and this will be available, like I said, online after the meeting. Um, the links, if anybody clicks on, uh, or people click on the links, they will go directly to that section's area. So uh, it should be fairly easy to jump around in the document when you're viewing it online. The document is designed to be viewed either online or downloaded. So these links can, you can jump to the section that you are interested in and do a lot of jumping around. Uh, you do not have to read it from beginning to end. 77 pages is pretty daunting for anybody. So, um, but it does provide uh, a lot of information for anyone interested and uh, in every category that, that we could uh, get done. I do want to compliment the, um, 
the uh, staff of the Tallinn Public Schools, uh, as well as the track committee. Um, they have done an amazing job and they continue to do an amazing job. Track is helping out immensely with its feedback. Um, lots of great stuff from the community. I'm getting all kinds of text and information that's helping us. Um, and uh, the staff is doing an absolutely amazing job of um, getting you know, information and, and putting uh, together plans under circumstances that are constantly changing. So I can't thank the staff for the Tallinn Public Schools enough. Um, they've really done an amazing job as well as the community members that have been contributing through track and otherwise. So um, just walking through quickly, there's a you know, brief rationale where the state of Connecticut is coming from. You know, in brief, where the state of Connecticut is essentially coming from is that the data on transmission right now and prevalence of the virus suggests that uh, the state of Connecticut is um, is pretty um, is in a good place with respect to the. Um, uh, you know, uh, with the spread, so um, not not many people in Connecticut are um, are in a dangerous situation with this. So the state of Connecticut has uh, moved forward with an an all in um, version of schooling, all persons in person all the time. You know, all open to all students, uh, mainly because of the fact that we have such favorable conditions, um, and that the mitigations have been very effective. So um, Connecticut is doing much better than many other states, and that's essentially why the state of Connecticut feels that it is uh, a safe situation for students uh, to be in schools. Um, you know, all in uh, for every day, five days a week. Uh, they they also they do caveat that if things change, they'll be changing that approach. Uh, if you take a look at the next section, calendar drafts. Um, right now, we're looking at a couple of prototypes for what um, what may uh, be a change to the calendar. This would have to be approved by the Board of Education, so this may be on a, an agenda coming up for the board. Um, draft prototype, well, to look at the original unmodified that was approved by the Board of Education uh, last school year, that's the last bullet in section 1.2. Um, the section numbers will also be updated between now and Friday to, to make a little bit more sense. Right now, I was just putting in the sequence to make sure that these things had a sequence that uh, people could click on and, and jump to a section. But the last part here, uh, the last bullet in this section is the current calendar for uh, for the coming year. Prototype 1 has a September 8 start date. Um, early release days are specified as they were in the original calendar. Additional beginning of the year preparation days and potential parent guardian info days are added to the beginning of the year in Prototype 1. And the last day of school in Prototype 1 is um, is actually the 15th of June. So taking a quick look at prototype one, and this will be available again um, online, um, you can see how the purple at the beginning represents the extended uh, prep days for uh, staff in the district, and it puts the beginning of the school um, around September 8th. Um, so you'll see that it goes past that Labor Day period, um, and we you know, we would begin, which gives uh, more time for uh, appropriate training and preparations, and that type of thing, which is the thinking there. Uh, prototype 2 also has a September 8th uh, date. Early release days are added every Wednesday. So that, um, you know, there was a feeling that um, that kind of uh, early release on a regular basis would be very beneficial for making sure that uh, education is provided at the highest levels um, and that staff would be able to continually adapt with the additional time. It would give more organizational and training time under these changing circumstances. And so prototype two essentially is a start date of uh, September 8th, adding that um, there would be early release days every Wednesday. So in addition to the early release days that were part of the original calendar, Prototype 2 adds, as you might see through here, with the labeled in green um, days all the way through the year, uh, early releases on Wednesdays, and they would follow that early release schedule. If you go on to page two of this, it shows generally what the early release um, the schedule and dates would ultimately be. Uh, typically, it, it uh, school is generally done on an early release day. All schools have dismissed by about 12.30 or 1 o'clock. Um, so that'll continue to be updated. Um, prototype 3 has a September 1st start date, so it's not quite as far out. That does allow for a series of weeks as we enter school that are about you know four-day weeks, so it's kind of a slow phase in for people. Um, early release days in that model are every Wednesday as well. 
And uh, it does provide additional beginning of the year preparation days, um, but because it starts September 1st, um, some parent guardians may appreciate that. So getting started earlier, there are some four day weeks that also make it a little easier. And um, the end of school date in that scenario is June 9th. So it's not, um, you know, not quite so far out in the summer. It does provide a few additional days and a, and a kind of slower phase in, um, but it does start school on September 1st, a little earlier than the other models. Uh, there's also a suggestion that was made that perhaps the first two weeks would be half days. Um, that didn't make it into the plan right now, but it certainly is something that can be considered. Um, so feedback on that is appreciated and the track committee may uh, want to weigh in on that in our next track meeting. Um, this information and various aspects of this plan and thoughts on it will be a part of what we do in the uh, reopening committee and as well as uh, with the staff on their um, reopening operations and curriculum teams. So um, so that's basically in a nutshell what we're looking at for calendar. Um, and the adjusted calendars, of course, will be adopted or changed or not changed at all. We'll decide that in the next two weeks by, um, you know, it, or next two or a couple of weeks as the board has a chance to look at that. Um, once again, please, um, if you could mute your uh, mute your computers or mute your mics, it will help us. Otherwise, I'll have to apply uh, another all mute to everyone. Uh, we deeply appreciate it. We know it's not easy to do this online stuff, so thank you for that. Um, so as we're going through, the next section is basically the core priorities for the school district. Um, you get a good sense of those, and they're very obvious. Safety, providing opportunities, uh, providing emotional supports, and equity. State of Connecticut also has made clear its guidelines and its approach uh, to safety in the state of Connecticut for schools for all in schooling is relying really on uh, four pillars, which is cohorting, which allows for contact tracing identifications if needed. Uh, transportation, uh, making sure that uh, you know we're using increased cleaning and protocols there, which are identified in this document. PPE, also known as personal protective equipment, and then uh, doing a, the best that a district can with social distancing. Um, our expectations of students and adults are listed here. Um, this is a very important piece that you know um, that uh, you know our first line here will be uh, parents and guardians at home uh, and you know I have three children myself you know taking a look at the kids every single day um, looking at their attempts making sure they're ready and able and healthy to go to school um, if all parents and guardians are keeping a close eye on kids as they're heading off which I know can be difficult because there's a million things going on all the time um, but we will collectively protect each other uh, each other's children and each other's families if we're paying close attention to um, you know, what the kids' uh, you know, status is with respect to uh, their, you know, their temperature and whether they look like they have any of the symptoms. So information in this document will provide what to look for. But if kids have a temperature of 100.4 or higher, uh, they should be home as well as if they have symptoms. And we as a school district would be, um, would be supporting families to make sure that they felt like they could do that and kids would still have the opportunity to be able to you know, keep up. So um, that's really the most important line is that if students are not doing well, that they stay home. Um, and that will help everybody. Face coverings, you know, having the support of the community and having kids wear the appropriate PPE and face coverings is crucial, you know, and, and you know, reiterating the behaviors of good hygiene, hand washing, and so on. And adult expectations, again, morning self-screening of kids, helping us out with the masks and making sure everybody's wearing what they should be and, you know, making sure they have uh, sanitizers and things. Um, those kinds of things will go a long way in helping keeping everyone protected. And the state of Connecticut feels they are sufficient um, given the data right now that we have on uh, transmission and prevalence. Um, to give people an idea of what it looks like, the personal professional, I'm sorry, the personal protective equipment, the state, uh, um, sorry, the school system, the town school system will be issuing PPE to all staff and all students. Uh, it is reusable, washable PPE. Um, so in this section, you see what it looks like more or less. There is a mask that has the Tallinn Public School emblem. All families will be receiving this PPE um, in a packet at the beginning, um, and they will be able to uh, they will be able to you know um, 
wash that and um, use it. Kids will be issued a protective face shield and they will be able to carry that shield in their backpacks and take it out much like they would a calculator. So if they're going into certain environments where they may be closer or um, you know needing to do some kind of group work or in science, a lab, they have the shield and that face shield adds another layer of protection. So the Tom Public Schools will be using these two items in conjunction. Um, and they are shown to be very effective when used together. Um, when, you know, depending on the situation, a child might be wearing that face shield. In other situations, they may be wearing just the mask. But these two things together and having the versatility of all students having one and taking it out when you know, asked and putting it back when is unneeded um, will function uh, very effectively in uh, helping us be very flexible with uh, what we do. So here are some basic examples. Uh, here is a a child that is wearing the PPE that would be used for the district. Um, and then here are other examples of some of the other barriers that would be used, for instance, in an inclusion setting with uh, reading. You see one of the staff um, in a one of our, what we call sort of, um, I forget what you're calling this now, but an elliptical table. It's not an elliptical table. <laughs> I can't remember. That's a piece of workout equipment. So I don't know. I'm tired. But this is, you know, you get what I mean. It's like a, you know, a little pear table, half moon or whatever. And um, you'll see how that, um, how the plexiglass would work on such a thing. There's a little space underneath for them to pass things. So uh, if they're using that, they may not actually need the face shield, but in some cases they, uh, they'll be using the face shield because they may be in situations where we can't have legs clash, but they'll be in close proximity. And um, there's also uh, what's called flexible barriers that they can be lifted up or down. Um, this particular one is an example of a Wernger. Um, and then you'll see that there's other plexiglass, uh, plexiglass examples um, I'll kind of move that down here. Oops. Dr. Willa, I don't know if you uh, are checking the waiting room regularly, but... I uh, definitely am. I keep clicking okay. this admit cool. all every 10 okay. seconds. Thank you. <laughs> so okay, great. Thank I you. apologize. Yeah, no, I am. I'm, uh, I'm clicking it, but I'm noticing, uh, you know, for whatever reason, this is supposed to have 500, um, and I notice we're at 176, and people are bouncing in and out. So I'm not sure what's going on, but... Um, but I'll keep clicking it. Um, anyway, Thank so you, Will. no problem at all. No problem at all. So this plexiglass speech language path example, this is what some of the speech language pathologists might be using. Um, gives you an example. Um, they can also use it in conjunction with the PPE and the face masks. Um, some of the face masks will also be um, you know, opaque so you can see through their translucent, so you can see the uh, the the face and the lips in case they're using or doing some speech pathology work and they need to see it. We'll have masks that are able to do that. Um, portable barriers will look like that. Uh, fixed barriers, you'll see fixed barriers in the offices and in the nurse's office and guidance areas. Um, these fixed barriers will be looking very similar to the one that you see here listed at the bottom of this page. Um, so this gives you an idea of what the, the kids, you know, PPE and plexiglass and other things that would be utilized in the um, Thailand public schools um, or how it would be utilized and what it would look like. Um, so that'll be available to take a look at tonight. Again, please keep in mind that what I am publishing tonight is the draft draft version um, provided and you know, presented, but that um, the document will be in its final final draft form, you know, given to the state on the 24th, and I'll be posting an updated version of it at that time. Um, that'll be the actual version we send to the state. So. Um, this is the Pandemic Continuity of Learning Plan Committee statement. Um, it explains what our general structure has been for the teams working on this. The pandemic response conditions um, are one of the more important things to, uh, to attend to. And essentially what it does here is, um, and again, just I want to caveat that these are, uh, especially when you look at the thresholds, um, these thresholds are merely a placeholder for the state of Connecticut. Uh, we are told that the state of Connecticut will be providing providing the information about how the state and districts and schools um, will be moving from one condition to another. So what's in here right now is an example of what's existed in the past for pandemic plans. Um, it's a placeholder for what uh, the state of Connecticut 
you know, will, might be providing or, you know, for when they're providing it, um, it'll go in that section. And it could be, you know, like a like that threshold where it's a percentage of your school population. It could also be something very different. So we're waiting um, on that. And the, the health districts are going to be providing that information to the superintendents and the schools probably in the next few weeks, which is why, again, these documents, no matter what school system they're coming from, are subject to change in a variety of ways. So just to give you an idea, there are three main pandemic response conditions. There are There is the in-person condition, which in Holland we call IP. There is the partial in-person, which is the PIP. And then there is the... Um, there's essentially online learning. I'll scroll through quickly so you can see. Um, there's the out of school online learning, which is the OSOL. And each re you know, relates to a certain level of prevalence of COVID-19. So if you are in the um, in-person pandemic response condition, you have a low prevalence of COVID-19 uh, in the state and or your county or schools at this time. And that is what um, is currently the status of the state of Connecticut is a uh, low prevalence COVID condition. And so the characteristics of that are listed in this table as are the general schedules. These are generalized statements for more information or more detailed information. Um, one can click on the school operation plan section and they're brought all the way to that section. Um, but breakfast and lunches are in person um, and programs continue. Uh, any students online currently, we're planning on providing, um, I'll put that in here, any online um, students uh, will have the opportunity to pick up a bag lunch, much, much like they did um, in the uh, March, April, May zone. And um, so we will be providing meals also for families who choose that they uh, would rather do the um, online version, which the state of Connecticut um, requires is available. So um, the, the situation will be very much like a typical school day, with the exception that there will be much heightened cleaning, um, many more um, PPE, you know, obviously PPE requirements, um, and many more requirements in terms of, uh, of how we execute our school day with respect to timing. And you'll see those in these school operation plans. There's modified schedules, there's modified passing times, um, many, many more lunch waves. Um, the whole system is designed to provide um, a kind of teaming or cohorting approach and also to provide uh, um, many mitigation you know, mitigation strategies for so, so that kids are not, uh, you know, they're not interacting the way that they would in a typical school year. But the rest of it is the same. The grading, um, assessing, and teaching stays the same. For online students, the plan right now would be that um, if you're, Mr. Willett's class starts at 10 o'clock and is block two, and I'm just throwing numbers and blocks out there, but if it starts at that time, um, there'd be a link and you jump into Mr. Willett's online you know, class and there's maybe 16 kids in person and maybe 10 or five or 10 kids online. Um, they're seeing it at the same time. That's currently the approach that the Tallinn Public Schools would like to take. Um, and uh, in the next few weeks, uh, we anticipate that you know, that'll be coming together as we work it out with the bargaining units and, and get the final, uh, final uh, you know, plan in place. But um, the hope is to offer the platinum online plan for anyone who wishes to do that. Uh, the best foot forward, the best, uh, the best possible way of doing it is the goal of the Tallinn Public Schools. So moving to the next section, um, if things get a little bit more dicey with respect to the COVID virus in the state of Connecticut, the uh, condition could be changed and uh, schools, either an entire district, a school, or um, a team or even a class within a school could be put into a different uh, condition. Chances are that if you're dealing with a uh, class or something, that it would be an online condition that they're put into. They might not be in, you know, put into a partial in-person. It's more likely that the entire school system would be put into a partial in-person condition by the state of Connecticut than it is that a class would be. If a class was going to be put into a different pandemic response condition, it might be that the entire class uh, has to do online learning 
learning for 14 days. And that might be something the health district says. If there's an identification or two or, you know, something like that in a class, it may say that that entire class or team needs to go home for 14 days and participate in online learning. So that is, um, you know, it's unlikely that a, that a class would be put in a partial plan for a variety of reasons. But this is listed here because the entire district and all districts could be put into their hybrid plans. So if the state of Connecticut decides that a moderate prevalence is occurring of COVID-19, it might order all districts into their hybrid plans. It's also known as partial in-person plans. It's also been known as blended plans. And in Tolland, it you know, I tried to make it pretty straightforward. It's your partial in person. And what does that mean? That means that kids would be separated into A and B groups. And that's some variant of rotating those children through the schools would be um, would be uh, executed right now. You know, it might be that A day, there are the A groups of students would be coming to school in person on Mondays and Tuesdays, and they'd have online Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The B group would come in Thursday and Friday for in-person, and they would be online Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then Wednesdays, everyone would be online and um, people would be working outside of the building and the building would be deep clean. So in a partial in-person uh, program, you would have, uh, you know, two days on for each group and three days off for each group with a middle week day that no one is in the building except for the cleaners. And um, so the weekend would be a cleansing time and Wednesdays would be a cleansing time and populations would be brought down to about half what they are right now because you'd be splitting them into A and B groups. So that would bring transportation down even further in terms of the number of kids that are on each bus and the classroom sizes would be pretty much halved from what they are now. Um, in a situation with a uh, partial in-person program. So that would be a condition that the school might be put into if, um, if uh, they notice that prevalence is rising and that we have a moderate concern level. Um, and in Tallinn, that is called the partial in-person pandemic response condition. And finally, as, uh, as you've seen, I'm sorry, the spacing gets off a little bit here, but um, I don't know if I can get it. The pandemic response condition of being in um, out of school online learning is one in which there is a high prevalence of COVID-19, much like uh, the situation we were in in March, April, and May of this year, uh, this past year, school year. And the state of Connecticut would order the entire school system or school systems or even a region of school systems or this whole entire state into an online condition, in which case um, they'd be using um, you know, online learning methods that, um, you know, that we're trained, that we're going to be training for. And, um, you know, and in this case, we'd be uh, endeavoring to provide a synchronous learning model uh, over the asynchronous model that was in March, April, May. We do have the equipment that's coming in. Um, teachers will have Bluetooth ear sets. They will have uh, cameras with 12, 15 to 20 foot extensions. Um, and the equipment, uh, we're working on all the computers right now to make sure they're going to be capable of managing and running this stuff. So uh, teachers will have um, the equipment available to them to be able to execute the online learning in their classrooms. Um, and uh, the idea would be that kids logged in and experienced it in real time. So this is uh, the highest pandemic condition. Uh, students would not be interacting and would not be in school. And it would be back to picking up meals uh, as we did in the March, April, May zone. And, uh, it would, you know, in this particular case, um, it may be that a health district puts a class into this condition or a team or a school and not necessarily all schools in the district. So this is the kind of uh, situation that actually could be applied in a smaller uh, to a smaller grouping than the entire district. Um, and that may be what happens. So. Um, so then, you know, as we go along, I'm sure they'll, uh, the state of Connecticut will provide a little bit more guidance and what it expects with respect to that as well. Um, so taking a look at the in-person plan, cohorts, groups, and schedule overview, this just gives you the helicopter view of things. Uh, the individual school operations plans give you much more detail. Um, so looking at this, uh, we'll just give a, a parent, guardian, or anybody else sort of the, the high-level view of um, of what each level, uh, you know, has as, as its general operating parameters. And I'll, uh, you know, essentially elementaries are more on this class by class level. 
they'll be doing um, their specials will be, you know, set up in a way that minimizes uh, student passing conditions um, and is designed on a time span where they're doing a certain special for a longer period of time. You know, music will be handled in a, a variety of ways depending on the levels um, to maximize safety once again and take into account developmental level of the child. Um, and so, you know, we, we tried in this plan to make sure that it was very responsive to the, the developmental level of kids, knowing that a kindergartner may not respond the same way as a high schooler. So, you know, the, the opportunities that are available to each group, uh, you know, really has to do with what their developmental levels, um, you know, are, allow us to do. So that, that will be, you'll be able to see that we adjusted to that throughout the document. Um, transportation, uh, this gives an overview of what transportation is like and what is expected, but also goes into some more granular detail about bus cleaning. There is a product now called Zunoside uh, Z71 surface sanitizer. It's been a revolutionary sort of um, product for um, for the COVID-19 virus situation, it's been used in the United Kingdom extensively, um, and it has uh, it has a very good track record. So information about this would be uh, is provided here, and there's also links that uh, parent guardians can take a look at. This would be one of the more important mitigation strategies with respect to the buses. Um, they do, you know, bus drivers do sweep the buses, wipe down surfaces and that kind of thing. But um, the Zunicide or Z71 surface cleaner is a uh, is is designed uh, specifically for purposes like this. And it has a um, impact time on application of about 30 days. So it has a long term impact and it's um, it's a very, very effective um, mitigation technique for uh, for this virus, uh, especially in a bus situation. So information is provided about it, as well as information from first student about um, what the approach is that the bus system takes, um, and um, you know, and and more information about uh, about the product um, that we'll be using in the buses. Ventilation, temperatures, and facilities considerations. Um, this section gives parent guardians a good idea of. Um, you know, what we'll be doing uh, in terms of mitigation for um, air systems. Uh, our ventilation systems are going to run from 6 a.m. to midnight, Monday through Friday. Um, they're going to be continuously increased and we'll be running, you know, 18 hours a day. Um, the current occupancy schedules, you know, will uh, be set at all schools um, to 6 p.m. That's much longer than they have been. We've been on an energy plan through Honeywell and uh, in order to make sure that we're maximizing um, you know, mitigations for the COVID virus, we are going to be running our systems far longer than we would have normally run them, um, you know, when we were complying directly with the energy plan. So the state of Connecticut has mandated that, uh, you know, school districts you know, make sure their ventilation systems are set such that they're providing the maximum mitigation for COVID and the tall public schools would be making that adjustment. Um, in addition, the uh, temperature set points have been for 76. They'll be reduced to 70. Um, as the kids are wearing this uh, personal protective equipment, um, I did provide a, a kind of testimonial from a young adult who was, um, you know, put in the equipment for three and a half hours. Um, just so you, you know, you know, I was not torturing a student of the Tallinn Public Schools. I was torturing one of the Willett children who was 13 years old, and she was our test subject to wear the PPE for three and a half hours and do continuous work in the uh, central office for which I paid her $10. So no one was hurt in the, in the, um, in the managing of this. The child made out rather well, if you ask me. But um, information, you know, she would then provided a kind of document, uh, sort of a, a statement uh, for our committee here that I'll also share with the track committee um, about what uh, what she felt when it was done. So um, we know that wearing this stuff is going to make them feel a little hotter, and she did say that. Um, so the uh, temperatures would be lowered, the set points would be lowered from 76 to 70 degrees um, to mitigate some of um, some of the, the, you know, students feeling a little hotter wearing all of this stuff. All school locations do have the windows and screens for fresh air and large 
larger events um, at the school system, you know, uh, if they're in the auditorium, the gym, or the CAF, those areas do have what's called MERV 15 filtration system uh, and filters. They are capable of filtering out the COVID-19 virus in those uh, in those areas of of the building, uh, the high school that we rent, at, you know, we rent out or use. We probably won't be doing a lot of renting out to outside organizations this year, but any larger things that we're allowed to do from the state of Connecticut within the parameters of what they're able, you know, they, they have required or their guidelines, we will be able to have larger events in those areas uh, if they are school events. And uh, we do have filtration systems that do filter out the virus at the high school in those larger areas. Um, also, uh, you know, we do have uh, the geothermal systems, which are very new. We're very fortunate in the district to have many new uh, systems, so we aren't going to have to go through what some of these other districts are that have very antiquated systems. Um, our systems are quite new. And um, you know, also in this section are examples of the kinds of sanitizing stations that will be available. And um, there's also a statement about temperature controls and thresholds uh, that if we do enter a certain threshold um, that in, in the NOAA identifies as an extreme caution condition, we may go into a, uh, a early release that day or we could actually not have school that day, much like we would have a snow day if the heat conditions were so high that it was going to create um, a condition within the school that would be in a in a NOAA caution zone. So I don't anticipate that now since we're going to be setting the set points much, much lower than they have been in the past. I know 70 degrees will be, will be pretty low. Um, but if that were to happen, uh, we would monitor the rooms. And because kids are wearing PPE, we would not be, um, you know, we, we would you know, we would be very careful to make sure that they weren't feeling um, overheated. Uh, educational alternatives, uh, essentially there's three main alternatives for parent guardians right now. Um, they can avail themselves of the in-person schooling that the state of Connecticut um, has provided for all students throughout the state. Um, they can go into the online learning. Uh, the state does caveat this as temporary or supposed to be temporary, but there is no definition of temporary. Therefore, for Tolland, if um, you're going to try to set it that if you know um, a parent or guardian wants to uh, have their child moved into the online learning, you know we will ask that maybe they give us a week advance notice so we can create um, what's needed. Um, also, if they want to transition their child back, we would ask respectfully for about a week's notice so we can get things transitioned. But uh, essentially, parent guardians can decide, you know, that they want their child to be in online learning at any point, and uh, the school district um, is responsible for making sure that uh, that child is has that available to them. So again, the goal here is to make you make it so that child would come in at a certain time, and that we'd be following the general schedules we have now. Um, because of that. So, uh, you know, if, if class starts at 9.30, uh, you click the link and you're joining that class and the next class starts at 10, you know, 11.30, you're clicking that link and jumping in there. Uh, finally, as has existed in the past, homeschooling is available or uh, it's an option for parents and guardians in the state of Connecticut. In this case, they actually are, um, they are taking their children out of the Tallinn Public Schools. In other words, unenrolling them. They are no longer enrolled in the Tallinn Public Schools under this scenario. Um, but parents can do this. And if they send a letter to the um, central office, uh, 51 Tallinn Green, and say that they are going to homeschool their children um, for that for the 2021 year um, or beyond, they uh, they just write that letter. We send back a, a form to fill out, but ultimately. Um, the parent has the authority to do that, and the child will, will be taken off of the enrollment of the Tallinn Public Schools. Um, in that case, they're not able to avail themselves of any of the online earning options. Um, they can't be involved in the sports and activities or any of that if they, if they run. run. Um, but, um, but there are other resources that the state of Connecticut will provide that uh, may make that a little bit easier during this uh, unusual year. So then the next section is monitoring, just some basic information about how things are monitored and what, at, you know, at what level and what escalates it. Um, nursing and medical conditions, you know, what the basic draft screen right now looks like, you know, when we're looking at the kids every morning um, or when parents are, you know, do they have a fever, do they have cough, are they having difficulty breathing, are they having intestinal problems? You know, for children, they are having these situations where they have these cold or purple blue toes or toenails. Uh, COVID has some really strange things that, um, you know, that are symptomatic. 
And so, um, you know, these kinds of questions will be the kind of questions that your children may be asked in school and that you're encouraged to ask, as well as staff um, will be also asked these questions and asked to think about these things um, as they are preparing for school every morning. So, um, you know, we'll be looking very carefully at the condition and health condition of, uh, uh, of staff and kids as we move through the year. And the staff, uh, the information, there's some information, you know, provided from the nurse's office in this section, as well as um, certain uh, statements about testing and safe return and things like that. So, um, you know, right now, this is, again, this is where we are as of um, July 22nd and ultimately the 24th. But as the state of Connecticut changes what it expects us to do, um, these these may change. And so you'll see that um, this is the general guideline that, uh, you know, the, the nurses are working off of right now. And that's been um, taken largely from um, state of Connecticut guidelines and things like that. Uh, COVID-19 case response protocols, um, this is just straight, straightforward general information about what you can expect from what, you know, how the school would respond and what its obligations are. Um, COVID community and uh, communications community partnerships, uh, the state of Connecticut requires that there's both district contacts and uh, individual school contacts uh, for the uh, compliance. And so listed here are the compliance liaisons, essentially they're the uh, the superintendent, myself, and the principals for each of the buildings, we are the health and safety compliance liaisons for a district of this size. Um, and there's uh, basic statements about um, Palm Public Schools communications during this, as well as a link in case anyone didn't have it to the uh, coronavirus response site. Uh, districts are, you know, need to have a site. And the one that we have for this district was uh, put together back in March, April, May. So as we get further into uh, into August, we'll be updating that. You'll notice that the information on there currently is a little outdated because it was transitioned to the Tall and Continuity of Learning Program site. Um, so what will happen is this particular coronavirus website will be updated to current coronavirus uh, conditions, um, and then we'll be updated from there regularly as we move through uh, the beginning of the year and then into the end, you know, next year or into the full year. A very short summary, basically saying we're going to work very hard to, to do everything that is expected and to keep the kids safe. And we care about them as we care about our own children. So you can, we can be sure that we're, we're not going to be falling short on that concern. Um, and in this section are the school operation plans for each of the schools. So you'll see there's one for Birch Grove um, with specific things. Um, that relate to children in that school. Um, and then ultimately, um, you're going to see as you go through this particular part of the document that there's one for intermediate school, one for the middle school, one for the high school. Um, and at the end of this particular area of the document, um, you'll notice that there is a special programs of you know, students of special education, special program section uh, that also illustrates what um, you know, students that are uh, in any kind of special education program are, uh, you know, can expect. So, um, so essentially, it's it's where we are at this moment in time. Um, and as we clean it up to provide to the state, you know, some semantic things may be cleaned up a bit, but uh, but the content of it will be staying mostly the same between now and Friday as we head towards, um, you know, submission. So that essentially wraps up the main sections of the document. Then you enter into, um, you know, into the appendices. So in the appendices, you'll see uh, there's research and citations. Um, this, again, is kind of where it was at a snapshot in time. There'll certainly be more research coming out. Um, but it's uh, essentially the foundation of the justification for the state of Connecticut with respect to returning children to school right now in full, you know, in full form, um, because they, uh, you know, the children do not seem to be in, uh, deeply negatively affected as far as the research that uh, you know that is available at this time. Um, that's not to say that you know parent, you know, parent guardians and grandparents and so on aren't, um, you know, aren't uh, at risk. Um, but the kids seem to to be pretty resistant, or or you know, when they do get it, the impacts are not 
not as severe. So, um, you know, with PPE, the shields and the masks and the various mitigations and the, the fact that the state of Connecticut's in a very you know, favorable condition with respect to prevalence and transmission right now. The state of Connecticut feels that there is a low, low risk for transmission uh, from kids to adults. And that's why they are, um, again, um, really uh, putting that model of all in all the, you know, all five days and so on as the opening model for the state. These are just basic appendix areas for mastery grading, online grading and assessing. Finally, the checklists, which are the thing, you know, when we begin the year, we're going to be going through the checklist to make sure that we're adhering to these items. They're shared with, um, you know, anyone who would like to take a look at that. And then at the end of the document, you have um, certain thing, you know, certain sections that will be updated. Um, including, you know, potential budget impl implications. This does not mean that these will be incurred. Um, it's just, you know, when you look at what the highest possible level of some of these things could be, um, you know, extending para hours, you know, about 67,000, you know, bus monitors need to be put on every bus for every run all day, all the time. Um, that's huge. So a lot of districts will probably not be doing that. Um, you know, they'll be relying on PPE parents and the drivers, as well as the, uh, you know, the mitigation of um, uh, measures that uh, first student is taking. And then um, PPE costs, you know, right now we have expended in the forty dollars to $50,000 range. Uh, some, um, some disposable items may get us a little higher than that, but we have mostly already acquired what we're going to be doing. So um, that cost may not go up in a crazy way, but... Um, but that could be at the end of the year, what you're looking at. And uh, again, we may be expanding substitutes because we do uh, have some statistics that suggest that while you know, 98%, 97, 98%, uh, in that range um, of our teachers and staff have said they're coming back, which I think under the you know circumstances, um, they're just amazing people. Uh, and I'm so thankful for the commitment they're making. Um, but also in there is that 26% of teachers and 30% of staff say that they uh, identify them, you know, themselves as high risk or potentially at high risk or someone in their family is at high risk. So even though we've got, you know, in the 90s of people saying they would come back, um, you know, as we all know, if conditions are changing, people are getting sick, um, those at high risk may, may, you know, be affected in a very short span of time, you know, we're all in a very close span of time. So the district has to be prepared to absorb up to 26 to 30 percent of its staff um, being out of school, which would mean that 53 people roughly would be, you know, that's 53 of the teachers alone. So um, we're working on making uh, accommodations for how we would address that if if the you know the a burst outing happened and we had a number of people out at one time we're going to have to look at all kinds of things to achieve that including additional substitutes um, and uh, permanent subs and um, you know various forms of looking at our time and the time you know timing for everyone asking paraprofessionals uh, to do certain things. So we're going to be working with bargaining units and seeing what our options are for providing coverage should we have a burst situation. And when I say burst, I mean, you know, it, it expands to the worst possible condition. Um, it looks like that that worst condition would be about 53 teachers being out at one time and um, for teaching staff and, and close to that for uh, parents and others that if that was the, you know, the high condition we were in, at that point, the state of Connecticut may put everybody in online anyway, but um, we would, you know, we would be, you know, having some things to do that we that could mitigate that and make sure the kids still had, um, you know, teachers in front of them and their classes were still going on. So we're preparing for that kind of thing. And it might mean some alignment of resources that is different than what we've got right now. And then uh, CIAC sports, one of the more difficult things, kind of a whack-a-mole version of what what is going on here. We don't really know from one day to another. And of course, to their credit, you know, they're trying and, uh, you know, things change for them. But, um, you know, this gives you a basic idea of where we are with that. Uh, athletic uh, Supervisor 
Todd Zendik is on the line constantly, weekly meetings about this, and currently this is where we're at. And the link provided here also gives people an idea of where CIC is at. In my meetings today, even, I know many, uh, there are many districts who are saying they're just not going to do sports this year because of the um, requirements and that uh, safety being the most important of them. So, you know, there are varying forms of uh, where this is going to be, but uh, CIAC is Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference dictates basically sports throughout the whole state of Connecticut. Um, you know, if some districts are not doing this, then the districts that would be competing against them would probably not be doing this. And um, Tolland goes into some areas that are not as safe as Tolland right now. So Tolland play, you know, might go to Meriden or Middletown, um, certain other areas of the state where their numbers aren't even as good as Tolland's numbers are. So this is, uh, you know, very care something that has to be very carefully considered. And um, generally, the more uh, districts that are not doing it uh, will will cascade because um, there'll be no one to compete with. And so, you know, it's anticipated that sports will be deeply affected this year and that it'll be at low, low levels. Um, there may be some programs, but they're, they're definitely nothing that we would be having um, as extensively as we would in a typical year. We do expect this to, to come back into balance in, um, in the uh, 20, you know, 21, 21 to 22 year. Uh, so, you know, it won't be forever, forever, but, um, but that's where we'd be. So this uh, is it. That's the document. Um, and I, I turn it over to the chair. Thank you, Dr. Willett. Um, a lot of work put into this. Um, at this time, if any board members have any questions, I'm sure there are a lot, so I think I'll, I'll limit it to two passes uh, through the board uh, to get through the agenda tonight. But um, if anyone would like to raise their little blue hand, we can go. I see Jacob. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I got several here and I'll probably shoot you an email, Walt, and I know we're meeting later and we can talk about some of these more in length, but a few things that stood out to me that um, I was curious about uh, is one, you mentioned temperature checks every morning for um, students, uh, and that's something that we want to do at home. Um, is there any thought about how we would enforce that? Um, Frankly, uh, there really isn't many options for us, in, you know, enforcing that per se, to use that term. It's, it's really that, um, and what I will do is constantly do outreach, and many of the, the principals and leadership will do um, a regular outreach to families that, you know, we're, we are, you know, to use the term that's been used probably too many times, we're all in it together, but it's true. Um, you know, we, we rely on the parent guardians to do that. And I have faith in our parent guardians in Tallinn that they will, um, we will just be asking and, and uh, reaching out uh, consistently and on a regular basis to remind people that, you know, we really need this in order to keep everybody in school, you know. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Willett. And, um, I've got some other ones, but I'll, we want to do the second pass. Christina, I'll um, yield the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. Kate, go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, just wanted to, I have, I have quite a few, and I think it's um, everybody who's here like deserve to hear the answer to these questions. So uh, 77 pages is, is daunting, but this is our plan for keeping our community safe. I don't think it's too much for the Board of Ed to read throughout the entire plan. Um, I want to thank the admin and the superintendent for the thoroughness. There's a slew of requirements, health, academic facilities, et cetera, and to manage this all is quite impressive. Um, I have a quick question about bus uh, cleaning and monitors. Um, you said that you're going to hire more monitors. Um, well, no, I, uh, right now the Tom Public schools are not planning on hiring bus monitors. The, the amount that that would require would be extensive. And the, if they're wearing the mitigating PPE, um, then we, we shouldn't be in a situation that would, um, 
you know, would require such a thing. But um, if we were to do that, the, um, you know, the cost of that potentially could be what's listed in this document. So uh, we may be thinking of other ways to manage that, but between first students' efforts at managing uh, spread, the state of Connecticut's current low pandemic condition, and, um, you know, and the uh, PPE, uh, the, there's a very low risk at this time of transmission. We also, uh, keeping in mind that our statistics showed um, in our first pass that um, the ridership will be down to about 50%. So most buses will probably be at a half level this year, just based on what people were reporting as their usage will be. Um, so uh, that will also have a mitigating effect um, as um, you know as the year goes on. Thank you. A um, couple more questions. Um, the first student is taking the charge with the, and I can't remember the name of the cleaning fluid that that you mentioned um is it the book is it the buses and like how how toxic is that to our kids and i know you're not a chemist and i <laughs> the doctor doesn't mean chemistry but like i'm assuming that there's been some some studies as far as safety um, so there i'm oh, sorry i didn't mean to cut you off go ahead no, no, that's it. Um, so yeah, that um, that was a big question on my mind too. Um, I drove people a little bit nuts with that when I was asking. I had a bunch of questions. We had a couple of meetings on that, and um, you know, I, I'm being told that, and I included that information here. Um, you know, there's no history of any type of allergic reactions. Um, that it has the same kind of uh, the data says that it's very similar. You know, in terms of how people handle it to how they handle vitamin C. Um, you know, it, it seems to be that um, the data on it, and it's been used in um, in England at this point, um, and it, the data seems to be favorable about uh, how it functions and its safety. So I included everything that I could get on that in this document. Um, and as more information comes out, I will, uh, you know, I will um, post that as well and update the document with it. Okay, thank you. Um, do all of our buses have cameras on them? I, as of this time, I believe that our buses have the cameras on them. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the next question I wanted to ask you about is like the ventilation systems in all of the school buildings. Um, in terms of like getting them inspected and seeing if they're up to code, I mean, you did speak about how often they're going to run and the fact that they're going to run more and that makes me feel a little bit better. But in terms of making sure that they are as up to par as they should be to fight these germs, uh, these this virus. Um, where are we at with that? Um, well, you know, again, we have one of the best facilities directors that in my 25 years I've ever met. Um, you know, he uh, there is nobody more fastidious than he is about um, about making sure everything is updated and checked. In fact, that's why you know his budget is what it is. Basically, he makes sure that you know we're on a cycle of uh, checking and updating. Um, so, uh, we're, you know, I'm confident in saying that our systems are, you know, are, um, updated and checked regularly. Um, they're very new systems in almost all cases. And as you know, Birch Grove will be an entirely new system, um, when it comes online at the end of this coming year. So, um, you know, we're in a very, very good place with respect to this. Um, and I have the highest confidence that, uh, Mr. Zdob has got, he's all over that and on top of it. We talk every single day at this point. So at some point I also could bring him into one of the superintendent's virtual coffees. If people want to do a Q and a with him directly, um, be happy to do that. If people just send that they're interested, I'll, I'll set that up. Um, but, uh, he's, I, I could, I, I, I guarantee that, that, um, you know, that he's on top of that and our systems are well, well taken care of and checked. Thank you. Um, in online teach training for teachers, um, you mentioned virtual school. Um, I've, I've a billion questions on this, uh, but I'll try to just keep it to a few. Um, do you already have dedicated teachers for this? Um, like, what's? I'm assuming that there's some parents that have said to you, "Yes, we're gonna we're gonna do virtual school. We're gonna keep our kids home." You know, so where are you at in planning for that? Well, you have about 268, I'm thinking uh, maybe 270 at this point, um, 
parent guardians were asked to um, reply or to respond to the survey for each child. And so um, as of a day or two ago, there was 270 children that would be starting schools this year as online, um, a little over 10% of the population of the district. And uh, in, to, to paraphrase or ra rather to sort of truncate the rest of it, there's probably a thousand on the fence um, that uh, parent guardians, you know, that there's about a thousand kids that, you know, they're just watching what's going to happen here and they'll see um, how it goes. So we could have upwards of 1,267 online at its high, you know, if there was a burst to use that term again, you know, if the, the, all those groups at the highest level decided to go in that direction. Um, that you could have as many as that availing themselves of it. That's why we really do have to take an approach of um, of having it be that if you're, you know, in Mr. Willett's social studies class, you know, there, you know, if that happens, and again, taking a look at all the other dynamics, and you know, right now I feel that you know, really have to be in a situation where the, Mr. Willett might be teaching 26 kids and, you know, six of them might be online and 20 of them might be in person or 10 might be online and 16 are in person. And those those online students are jumping in They're You know, they click the link, they jump into the class and, you know, the teacher has them on the, you know, the screen um, and uh, they're working with them. And if they do some think pair share work or they do some group work, they group the online kids um, together and the kids that are in in there and they do their group work that way um, but that's that's really under a situation like this I think the highest fidelity that we could have in that and if you think about the other factors involved like the unpredictability of the kinds of things we'll be dealing with that model is the one that also keeps us in a situation you know that um, that's manageable. Uh, the teachers will certainly have a lot of um, you know adjustments, and that's why you know when we look at those calendars, pushing the school year out a bit, giving more time for initial um, you know um, ramping up to it, and uh, those half days, those will be crucial in uh, helping our people keep things going. And, you know, that's why we'd be making such modifications. So, you know, I'm confident that uh, our, our teachers and educators can do this. They're amazing people. Um, you know, we, an admin will be jumping in where, wherever necessary or wherever we can. And I think that would end up being how we, we, would, we would approach this, this model. If we are in the, um, if we're in the all-in mode, that's probably how we're going to land on this. But I do have to continue to work with bargaining units and, and work through that. Okay, just one more question, um, and then I will pass. Uh, individual technology for students, um, it, it's in students' best interests and teachers' best interests if everybody has the same technology. Um, is that on the docket like where are we at i mean not that everybody in every, each grade has to have the whole, like the whole district doesn't have to have the same technology but a whole grade should have a whole the same technology so that everybody's talking in the same kind of language where are we at on individual technology for all of our kids yep so we have uh right now we have a uh, 800 of our chromebooks deployed um and you know in the field with the kids and families um there's another 200 with staff so a thousand are out there um and, um, you know, we're in the process of acquiring, you know, another 184 to 215, depending on the prices that we can get. So, um, you know, the survey results indicated that a good, good high percentage of families felt like they had the technology and had the Wi-Fi um, necessary to do this. And we will, you know, have the equipment for those families who may not be in that situation. We'll, we'll help with that, particularly help with the hardware. Uh, if we go into a, you know, complete online scenario, we'll, we'll be working hard to make sure families have that. But the district may have to make an expenditure to move towards one-to-one, -one, especially if things get more and more severe. Um, it depends on, you know, what the conditions are that we're in. And, you know, we, we are expanding one-to-one -one anyway. Um, but, you know, we'll just have to watch things carefully. Um, I'm confident that right now we're in a position where we can we can serve the kids, you know, and we're making the adjustments to expand. But uh, we'll have to watch it carefully and see how it goes. That's worrisome to me, but thank you. Thanks, Kate, for all those questions. They were good. Tony. Thank you. 
Dr. Whalen, my compliments to, to this document. There's obviously a whole lot of work that's gone on uh, even to get it to this point. So it's a good job to your staff and yourself and the community that's helped you with that. Uh, just a couple quick questions. I, uh, I'm interested in the, the classroom specific technology. I think you were talking about to be able to do the the, the partial in person or even the full time uh, that you were having to do some surveys of the computers that were in the class, possibly the Bluetooth for the teachers, cameras, that kind of stuff. Uh, how far are you into doing that assessment and what kind of turnaround time are you going to need after that point to, to fully implement? Well, you know, the pandemic hit everybody, uh, you know, in a, in a similar way. So, um, you know, we are, I think are in a good position to respond and we have already made some commitments. As you know, the, the, the Board of Ed committed the CARES Act funds to buying some additional Chromebooks and so on. Um, but one of the things that will be challenging is that, you know, as we get deeper and deeper into this year, depending on what happens, um, uh, the, there, there are only so many uh, companies and only so many Chromebooks. So, you know, it's about a four to six to eight week wait on um, on getting um, Chromebooks in when they're ordered. So, you know, I, I am confident that that we can respond to the needs. You know, it doesn't mean we won't have to make some adjustments. We definitely will have to make some adjustments, but that. Um, you know, we, we are in a position to be able to respond based on the data we got to the needs of the community. Um, you know, and, and I, again, I don't think it's perfect. We won't be in a perfect one-to-one -one situation, but that, you know, based on the feedback we got and based on what we have deployed in the field, we'll, we'll likely be in a position to at least manage things um, that, you know, as the year begins, unless something much, much more dramatic occurs. So, we're in a pretty good place to start, but uh, I can't I can't project like well into the you know next maybe six months because I'm not sure what's going to happen at that point. And second, uh, I know you're talking about specifically where you know we probably won't be renting you know the cafeteria or the the auditorium to other organizations during this this next six months to a year. What about uh, organizations such as RAGE? Will they still be using that area or are we shutting the building off to all of them? Well, um, so district uh, or anything that is district affiliated um, will be able to use the space and then I'll evaluate other ones on a case by case basis with specific specific to RAGE. RAGE is a uh, you know quasi school organization in that we have had a relationship for a long time. The majority of students in that are talent students. They have a, a room at the high school that they utilize. Um, so I look at them as a you know, quasi school organization. Um, and so you know we'd be looking at all of these on a case by case basis. And it's it's tall and kids. So essentially, what rage becomes is a is another cohort. So as long as we're in a certain condition, um, we should be able to to allow that cohort to meet. Understanding that if one child in the rage or one a young adult in the rage program came down sick, that's what the Eastern Highland Health District would be interested in is. Who, who is that child? Where? Who do they interact with? Um, so rage as a group could be put into a, you know, 14 day out status if a child in rage is sick. Um, but the mass majority of children in rage are Tallinn students. So I consider that quasi, you know, Tallinn, you know, a school organization. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Madam Chair. Thank you, Tony. Dana, you're up next. Thank you, Christina. Um, thank you, Dr. Willett. Um, this is uh, very informative and very thorough, and I, and I want to echo what um, some of my fellow board members said, and um, thank you for your time and dedication and the track committee and, and um, the staff uh, for working on this document and working so diligently and, and are being de so dedicated to the students and staff of Tallinn Public School System. So, Thank you very much. Um, first of all, can you just remind everyone where this document and where this track information can be found um, so that uh, people can go back and look at this documentation and and uh, where they can actually submit questions to the track committee and yourself, please? Yeah, um, so uh, it has been listed on a, on a number of the bulletins as they came out. Mm -hmm. um, It'll also be, um, if you go under superintendent's, uh, go into the district site, um, let me see if I can navigate to 
a couple of things here while you're asking the question. But as you go to the district site, you know, if you come to um, the superintendent's page here, um, there's a number of bulletins that reference it. Uh, if you take a look at real quick here, there's a uh, there's a link directly off of the superintendent's page for track. Um, so you click on that, and it brings you to the the site with all the information. You can also um, get it from the bulletins, a number of bulletins that have been sent to the community. Um, they're all listed as well off the superintendent's page, and. Um, you know, one of the last ones from uh, July 15th also includes links to um, the Tolerant Reopening Advisory Committee as well as other resources. No, want me to? Um, so that, that's all available in a series of places, um, including, you know, the bulletins, the website. Um, and if you do go to the track committee site to kind of take us back for a minute, um, if you are able to navigate on over to that, you know, uh, there's a number of information resources for parents, yeah. guardians, okay. and anyone else who's interested. It includes plans from other states. Um, it includes the learning hub resources if somebody's considering, um, you know, um, things that they may want to reinforce learning with and that type of thing. Those are, you know, linked off the site. And, um, you know, so there's a there's a very large amount of resources there. There's a lot to be uh, to be found. And then if mm -hmm. you go to the meeting information, you can actually see the actual agendas um, and and notes from the meetings. Um, and so you know, a person can take a look at you know, what were the general notes. I happen to be the scribe and the person running it, so you'll you'll you know you'll see information kind of written down as best uh, could as I went through it. But you'll see statistics that affect the conversation some conversations about online learning. This is from the 20th, you know, one of the resources the district's looking into for distance right. learning from Columbia, Eastern Highland Health District data that we get regularly, as well as more information on COVID tests and, you know, lockdowns and all of that. So okay. it has a lot of information. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure that um, other folks that are listening and the folks who aren't able to attend the meeting tonight know where they can go to get this useful information because uh, I think as Kate said, a lot of information is quite daunting and, and the fact that, you know, what do you say, 70 some odd pages, I think it's definitely worth a look um, so that people can educate themselves on, you know, what's happening and through the process. So again, thank you. Sure. Um, some of the some of the concerns, and I want to kind of tack on uh, the conversation uh, of technology that um, we were already talking about. Um, you know, I there are several folks you know that utilize their own technology, whether it be a Chromebook that they purchased or an iPad that they have at home or their parents' laptop or so on and so forth, which which did did and can and will continue to create. Um, opportunities for uh, bad communication or opportunities not being able to complete an assignment if in fact it is online. Um, I just want to make sure that the, you know, the Chromebooks and uh, it was kind of concerning that you said about the, the delay in ordering um, of the Chromebooks. And I did notice um, on one of the slides, you said uh, another 1300 Chromebooks, which could potentially increase uh, be a $338,000 uh, purchase price. Is that something, I know it was a potential budget increase, is that something that's top of mind? Is that something that we're readily talking about now? Um, uh, I, I feel like we need to be proactive when it comes to some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, another concern is I know that some people probably responded to the survey that yes, they have the technology, um, but then not realizing that they don't have the technology that is secure, like the school system has a technology that is securing, uh, that. Uh, for anything out in the world wide web where the school has safe fail safes to protect our children through that technology. Um, so, uh, you know, really great. Sorry, a lot of questions in that yeah, one. Yeah, that's my okay. And, Dr. Willa. <laughs> yeah, my limited cerebellum might not be able to keep them all in queue, but I will say this. Um, you know, the Board of Ed has taken some really important um, and crucial steps along the way, you know, as we looked at the, the way, you know, things were evolving and at the end of the budget year, um, and has, in its wisdom, set aside money into the Educational Reserve Fund and requested such money into the Educational Reserve Fund. One of the things that ERF can be used for is technology. 
Um, and that, that fund will be upwards of the $600,000, $700,000 range. So there is some money should the situation get to a point where the, the board would want to activate a course of action. And, and that's to the credit of the board. They did a great job, you know, setting aside some things. Also, money was moved to the town and requested, and the town council did discuss making um, that 40% of the transferred funds at the end of the year into a COVID-19 relief fund um, that, if non-used, would also roll into the educational reserve fund. So again, there's... Uh, a couple more hundred thousand there um, for mitigating things uh, should the board need to move in that direction. The board has done an excellent job of preparing itself for, um, you know, for some turbulence here. Um, so, you know, districts, uh, I've thrown, heard all kinds of figures uh, thrown out um, by various entities in the state and all that of you need to have a million, you need to have 1.2 million, you, need to, you know, um, and I think right now you're in a pretty good place where if the board wanted to take certain actions, it could. Um, uh, I, one thing that we really can't do, and I, I want to be very frank about this, is you know we have to be very, very careful of loading on heavy a lot of personnel because you can't hire a bunch of people just to lay them off at the beginning of the following year. That, that won't be something that most people want um, in terms of certain kinds of jobs. But I think by giving people opportunities to expand work hours um, and certain populations that may be interested in doing that in various forms, we can, uh, we can bend out to some of the needs without necessarily um, hiring a, a lot of new staff that we could not sustain um, beyond this fiscal year. So we just have to approach it. It's not going to be, uh, I know it's not going to be smooth and it's just a year like a pandemic year is not smooth, but it, but it will not be, you know, terrible either. We're going to make it through. We'll give a really uh, excellent education for kids. We'll support staff and families um, and we'll, we'll have some decisions to make along the way, but we'll make it work. Okay, um, I just have two more, hopefully. Thank you very much. Um, what does, um, what will the, I know that you said that there's different sections and you went through the different sections per um, school, which I think that is really, really good because each school has obviously different obstacles they need to face going back to learning. Um, but specifically um, with the um, portables in Birch Grove, because uh, I've heard, talks about using one hallways going one way or what have you, but in the portables and in those hallways and in those classrooms, I don't think that that's a realistic expectation. Um, is that something that the uh, track committee has discussed what classroom size will look like at Birch Grove um, and th things that, such as that? Um, I heard some of that. It got a little choppy. I'm, I apologize. Um, Sorry, I can take you off my no, I, earphones if you no, want. No, no, I heard that. Uh, don't let <laughs> not. I'm sure it's not you. I'm mean, It's not you. I'm sure you're fine. But I, it was a little like weird. You know, sometimes it gets kind of weird. Yeah techno sound like you're doing some kind of music you know so um what I, what I got out of that was um uh class class physical classroom size in birch grove is a concern is that what you were saying not in the hallways with the with this portables itself i mean it's not a typical school and and yeah. the hallways there's there's one hallway there's not multiple hallways to get into different areas so how does that look when it comes to the safety perspective um, yeah. and social distancing perspective and what does the classroom size look like at Birch Grove? So there is one, you know, there's a hallway to each area, each wing. You're right. There's not necessarily multiple ways to get to a different location. Um, you know, the portable classrooms, uh, those, uh, those who went through and toured it and so on, it does, it has a, they're done very, very well in that, you know, uh, they're, they're like many schools people experience growing up. You know, they have um, the characteristics of, of a school building, but but they are, as you noted, you know, square footage is going to be a little bit um, smaller in any portable structure, you know, uh, and, and to be frank, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. I mean, I think what the state of Connecticut is, is again, you know, relying on is that, um, is that there's very low transmission rates. And so they wouldn't be asking everybody back into schools or, or actually it's not an ask. They wouldn't be um, mandating um, all schools on all all days, you know, with all 900 hours, uh, five days a week. Um, if the statistics were showing that there was a high risk, they're looking at it as low. And if we add on top of that the PPE, you know, the fact that there'll be masks and then, then there'll be shields on top of the mask and then there'll be plexiglass on, on top of the shields on top of the mask and then there'll be ventilation systems that are running constantly and there'll be more sanitizing than, than has ever been done 
done before, and there'll be more cleaning with our Clorox 360 units that the board has purchased. And, um, you know, with all of these mitigations and the fact that there's low, um, low instances right now, it, it's going to be a safe environment for kids, but um, but there's never a situation where there's absolutely no risk at all. So, you know, it, it, it is going to be a risk, but, um, you know, going back to the research they've done, and that's again what the state of Connecticut is hanging their hat on here, that student, you know, young adults, young students, young children, they aren't as, uh, they aren't affected the way that, um, that other o older populations are. So they, they will likely not be deeply affected by it. Um, but there is no such situation no such condition where there's no risk. So understanding that there's always some risk, um, the state of Connecticut is thinking that the risk that um, that is posed by kids not going to school and social emotional damage and family stress and all of that, that's actually a greater risk right now than, um, than if kids are in school with low incidence. So uh, that building is what it is. It's what we have in Tallinn. Um, um, it's a good building. Uh, they're creating schedules and mitigations. The classrooms are set up so that the children will not be moving around a lot. Um, and when they are, they'll be moving through the hallway on schedules that um, have them not interacting with each other. Um, but um, we can't change the building structure we have. It's a good question. Um, we just we just have to work with what we have. Okay. Um, I guess then then to to tack onto that would be reducing sizing the sizes of the classes. Um, that's it. Sorry, yeah, yeah. we're reducing the size. <laughs> right. So, you know, right now our bus transport will be down to 50% um, based on what, what was responded to the survey. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, parent guardians are given the choice in the state of Connecticut to, you know, to do the online option. And right now, 268 are starting that way and possibly 1,000 are on the fence. You know, um, they, the state of Connecticut has given parents that choice. Um, it does mm -hmm. not, it's not doing the attendance or requirements that it normally has, um, not, not specific, you know, that a child can learn online at home without being affected by any of the state regulations on being physically in a school. So they provide that option because they know that a parent guardian may not be comfortable with the fact that schools cannot really do the six foot social distancing. We, we can't be all in and accomplish that. That's not a reality. And I, and I wouldn't sit here tonight and pretend that an all in school structure has a reality of a six foot, diff, you know, separation. Um, they've talked about giving tents to schools, you know, so that kids can, you know, learn in tents and they can expand out into tents. But the problem is, you know, if you have tents, but no teachers, you're going to have the tent to put them into, but no teachers to teach them. Um, so we can't, you know, there's only so many ways to divide the population. Um, if people are doing the online schooling, that automatically lowers the amount that are in the school, you know, in those classrooms. So there may be some parent guardians who find that to be a very um, you know, um, appealing choice. And the school district will also be working to help with, um, you know, community groups that if a, a group of parents in a neighborhood want to get together it's and set up a situation to move, um, you know, there are five kids, they may have attend, uh, go to different houses each day of the week. So they might be at Mr. Willett's house on Monday and Ms. Ms. Plord's house on Tuesday. You know, they might uh, have a situation where they have the kids move around to homes and do the online learning together. Um, that may be a way that um, the community uh, wants to work. And so more kids may choose that choice more parent guardians may choose that choice, which will lower the number of kids in the classrooms. Um, and the people that are going to the classrooms may be the ones that absolutely need that and don't have uh, any other options. So, you know, that's what the state of Connecticut is sort of looking at here is, you know, they provide the online option and in Tallinn will be very supportive. Um, you know, I want to provide a program for that. I want to provide you know, um, us uh, supporting um, community uh, members that want to try to get together that way. You know, if they are willing to sign a release, we'll share information um, of people in their area, in their geographic area of town, if they want to reach out to each other and create sort of these groups. Um, that would be a way within the state's uh, structure right now that those class sizes could be further physically cla physical class size could be further reduced but outside of that the state of connecticut has not provided any other way for school districts to provide a partial in person or lower class size option hamden did say they were going to do a 
kind of day off kind of thing, but um, that was against what the state said, and um, and everyone is anticipating there being a very strong response from the state to to district that would even think of that. So right now they are not um, they are not allowing that. And um, I've asked questions, and it has been made exceedingly clear to me what our options are, which are basically that we do not have another option to full in school. Um, parent guardians have the option. So we, we have that situation. Um, we don't have another way of doing it unless the state changes, um, you know, the response condition that we're in. And, um, you know, and I guess that's the best that I can do with that. I'm sorry. Okay. No, thank you very much. Um, and the last one is, and I'm sure it's more of a statement than it is a question. I'm sure you, you could refer me back to your document. But um, I just think, I mean, we talked a lot about the kids and you've talked a lot about the safety of your staff. Um, but I just want to make sure, you know, I, you know, I understand that you've touched upon the kids and the staff safety and fluidity of of your staff, staff safety, and um, it is is paramount, and I know that it is top of mind. And every single thing that you've answered tonight has so far had um, your staff members and the students of the Tom Public School System safety top of mind. So I'm just very appreciative of that, and I'm also very appreciative of the thoroughness of this document, this document that you provided tonight. So thank you. That's all I have, Christina. Of course. Thanks, Dana, and thanks, Dr. Willett. See, I think I have. Sure. Oh, just a reminder to the public: uh, only the board can ask questions right now. You have to wait uh, for public participation. Um, Simmer, our student representative, I'd love to give you an opportunity to speak. Um, my question was that, um, like um, last year um, when we just started online learning, our G. PA um, didn't officially count towards our transcript. So um, if during the fall semester we just switched to online learning, will it be the same or will our GPA be counted? Simmer, great question. Um, the, the goal right now is to have GPA function the way it would function in any typical school year, regardless of pandemic condition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Simmer, great question. Uh, Karen, I don't believe you've gone yet. Uh, yes. Um, Dr. Willett, thank you for this and to your staff and the reopening committee members um, for their input too along the way. It's um, a very extensive document. Thank you so much for all the hard work. Um, I just had a, a couple additional questions. Some of mine were already answered by other, other um, asked by other board members. So, um, I was just wondering about, um, you talked about the energy portion of things um, and how the Honeywell contract would be affected by this. And I know that's with the town. Um, I'm assuming that maybe the year to year comparisons would be voided or negotiated or something with the town because we're in extenuating circumstances. Yeah, you know, again, um, Tolland has done an excellent job um, of, of setting up systems that, um, you know, that help during, during any kind of anomaly. So uh, we have the USIF fund, the Utility Internal Service Fund. I believe I got the acronym right. Um, and when, uh, you know, when things are good, we put money into that fund. And so, um, you know, you never want to see things drain or things go away. But, um, you know, we, we have some, you know, options for if uh, we're going to have to, which we are going to have to, um, not follow the the energy parameters we would typically follow. So we're not going to be putting as much money aside for, say, new boilers and things like that as we would. The USIF fund has functioned to help provide a place for, you know, when we saved money. Um, and we will continue to maximize resources. Uh, uh, the director of facilities, uh, Pete Staba, uh, has done an amazing initiative to update our lighting, which is going to save immense amounts of uh, money in the future. But you know, the uh, 
you know, that fund has collected some of those savings and been used to mitigate um, certain energy related purchases. And so I would imagine that it's going to be used to mitigate some of the impacts we're going to have this year by not being able to follow the set points we would typically have. So, um, you know, knowing that we got to get through the year, I think we'll be able to, to do that, even though we are going to be expending much, much more energy than we usually would. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, um, as far as staff, I realize, you know, things are pretty fluid right now. Uh, numbers are going to change probably as we get into August, um, even from survey. And you talked about the, you know, uh, parents choosing to have their children learn online and that number may change. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding and, and I can review the document more uh more thoroughly, but um, you mentioned cameras in the classrooms. Is that is that what I heard about being able to teach from the classroom as well as <laughs> teaching kids at home at the same time? Is that am I imagining that correctly? No, uh, every teacher will be issued a um, um, Logitech camera, or a uh, may not be exactly Logitech, but it will be issued the camera and the mic. Um, in a 15 to 20 foot cable, as well as Bluetooth, it'll work underneath the PPE, um, and their systems are being updated as we speak. Um, you know, we have teams of people out there working on that. So, um, you know, I'm confident that teachers will have the technology in place as we begin the year or soon thereafter. Um, you know, we got to give them the time to make sure they're feeling comfortable with it, which is the goal. You know, there's never enough time for any of us to do anything. I think the one thing we all wish we had more of was time, no matter what we're talking about. But, um, but you know, the state gave us some leeway with additional days. Um, our staff are very intelligent, talented people. So we will, we're going to have the, we're going to have the equipment um, and we're going to have the, the, you know, the imperative, these kids, you know, our children need this in this pandemic year, they need us and they need to be able to come to class, whether it's virtually or in person. Um, so we're going to be there for them. And um, I know this staff, they're an amazing group of people. They, they pull the weight, you know, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. You're going to be fine because you've got amazing people here. So um, I'm not worried that they're going to be able to, to pull it off. I do. Re I do think we're going to have some, um, turbulence you know as we begin like any new thing with all kinds of new equipment but i expect that we'll be well underway within you know within a few weeks and um and uh and and you know we'll probably be able to to function you know with high level effectiveness right out of the gate um but they, they'll have what they um they'll have the technology that they need to do it um and we have uh, the staff being positioned right now to help them including looking at uh you know some coaching uh, stipends for people in the building who are already particularly talented and we'll be uh we'll be leveraging everything we can okay great thank you um and then things like signage in the schools and arrows and that kind of thing is that um is that an additional cost or is that well, well i don't you know, want to get into cost but i mean i know that that's all part of everything that is involved in making this happen so it is. And, um, you know, I think, I don't think that'll be the, the cost that breaks, the breaks the back or the bank. Um, we'll be able to do that. There'll be lots of signage, lots of prompts, lots of cues, lots of behavioral work. And, uh, you know, for instance, I know at Birch Grove, they're carefully scheduling transitions through hallways and explicitly teaching students, you know, to look at the signs and what to do and how to pass and looking very carefully, you know, to help remind people of social distancing. And they'll embed those in their lessons too. Um, the visual reminders will be coupled with uh, verbal reminders and, you know, they'll create all kinds of, I'm sure, creative songs and things to keep the kids looking. You know, when you see the arrows, this is the way you go. And, you know, I'm just going to murder anything I try to do. But they're, they are going to, and they have planning, have been planning and talking as we speak about exactly those things. And I don't expect that those particular costs will be the ones that would break us, you know. And I have lots of faith in our staff and your leadership and I'm sure making all of that happen and very caring way for our students. Um, and then I would just echo my concern also about um, having Chromebooks available 
Um, and I think, you know, those of us that participated in the middle school instructional rounds um, were very impressed and learned a lot and understood the importance of technology as an educational tool and that comes to play, especially now. Um, so just echoing my concern as well, as far as students having the same technology um, to be consistent for the teachers and for their learning as well. Yep. That's okay. all I have. Totally understand that. And you know, there are question marks around it. So we'll, we'll keep watching that situation. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, let's see. I think everybody went. Um, Jacob. Thank you, Christina. Um, is Rini on the call? I thought she was on the call. Did we talk to her? Sorry, I was just. Oh, Rini, oh, did, you didn't here. raise your hand. You don't have any questions, do you? Um, well, I'm on the committee, so I, a lot, I, uh, this is not kind of my first time through some of this, and I appreciate Dr. Rollett, you know, taking everybody through, and I think it's a great, you know, presentation, but I don't have any questions right now. I've had an opportunity to ask some questions outside of this also, so I'm good at this time. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Rainey. Go ahead, Jacob. Okay, so I'll just have a couple other um, questions. So uh, first one I wanted to ask was, uh, because we're going to have you know all these different health procedures now in place are there any licensing or certifications that we as a district perhaps individual staff members might need or um, extra training um, you know anything along those lines that might need to be taken care of definitely extra training um, but you know, we are um, as a state you know organization as a sort of bureaucracy we have lots of certs you know um, mm -hmm. nursing certifications and uh, various levels of ed cert so um, we're probably good with whatever certifications that are needed uh, everybody you know somebody's got one of them no matter where we are in whatever school but um but we will need to uh, we will need to do more training uh, particularly um you know we need to get everybody feeling comfortable with the idea of um this synchronous online learning and um that is something that um you know, really, it's on me. If teachers are not having a good experience with that, I, as the superintendent, need to really bend over backwards to make that work for them, um, because they're the ones that are, you know, in the in the front line there, helping the kids. Um, so I'm gonna, I will bend over backwards. You know, whatever teacher needs, um, I'm willing to come to a classroom myself and help. I have some familiarity with it, but um, we'll be, you know, there is no such thing as a fixed role this year. Um, you know, we're going to be bending over backwards to support the people that are supporting the kids. Uh, and that's, that's just the basic ethical obligation and professional responsibility. So uh, I'm confident that, you know, we need, we need the training, but I'm confident we're going to get it. And I'm confident that we'll get the teachers and the staff the support that they need. Okay, thank you. And um, my second question was, so... Correct me if I'm wrong, but the plan is to screen all, all the students every single day for certain symptoms of COVID-19. Is that? Yeah, to, to define the word screen, um, no, so parents and guardians will be the mm -hmm. first level. You know, they'll yep. be looking at them and going through those steps, right? Um, we're not doing temperature checks and we're not giving COVID tests um, because uh, – and we talked a little bit about this in committee. They're they're about 42 to 125, and they're only good for like five days. And so organizations like ours don't benefit that much okay. from some mass testing paradigm. But we will be we'll be looking carefully at them, both at the parent guardian level and at the staff level as they come in. Okay, so I guess my question wasn't necessarily COVID tests, um, but more just look going over those signs and symptoms, like you said, like the. Um, I can't remember and list all of them, but I know that you talked about them in the document. That's part of the plan to have staff do that with the students each day, or at least some of them. Yeah, I, the staff will be, I'm sure, very interested in keeping an eye out for um, you know kids who may not be feeling the way that they need to, and understanding that, you know. Uh, kids don't. I mean, you know, they get in and, and uh, halfway through some of them, you know, they'll, they'll have the strep throats or they'll have various other, you know, maladies. So, you know, we expect probably to be sending more kids 
um, to the nurse and calling more parents this year because we we won't know what they are and I'm sure parents will be looking at you know some of the kids and they're not going to be sure so we do expect there be higher absenteeism um, um, but all of it will be gen you know because people are being more careful and so uh, yeah I, I think that everyone will will step up and keep everybody else safe we literally are going to be protecting each other so okay absolutely I agree with that so there but to um just so that I understand there's it's more of just if you see something say something so to speak as far as symptoms go not there's something system systematic where you come in they're going to check it and or ask you some questions every day and do that for every student it's more kind of if you see something yes uh, teachers may be they yeah. may begin their day by going through a couple of questions but again um you know uh, no I mean, we're not going to be using say temperature checks for every child as they come in and we wouldn't be doing that kind of thing no no okay all right thank you thanks jacob uh, Simmer, is your hand up again, or did you forget to take it down before? Oh, okay. All right, we'll go to Kate. Thank you. Um, so I don't agree with you, Dr. Bullett. I do not think that the district would be able to function without you, so please don't sell yourself short, but that's not what my question is. Um, and I think... Something you just said, I do have a couple more questions, but something you just said, like I, I, um, I feel on a, on a visceral level. So I'm going to just bring this up. No, there's no such thing as a fixed role this year. And as a, as a, as a high school administrator, I feel that viscerally because this is so unknown and it's terrifying. And, you know, it, all of the th all the pieces of the plan are here, but um, we are putting a lot on our our staff members, and we're putting a lot on our parents. We're putting a lot on our kids, and I just want to like call attention to that from kind of an emotional standpoint, and also from a procedural like how to do school this way standpoint. I just want to put that out there. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, students who. Um, have, let's say, COVID-like symptoms regularly, students with health concerns, students who are immunocompromised, students with mental health concerns, um, and also with regard to teachers with the same kind of things, how can we allay their fears? How are we allaying their fears and concerns? You know, um, you know, this year it just has to be centered around love and listening. Um, you know, we, we have to love each other enough to make sacrifice. You know, if, um, if the Willett children, any of them look like they're not feeling very well, the love in that is that I make the sacrifice of a more frustrating day, but I stay home and I stay home with them, you know, and listening because there's a lot of fear and a lot of pain and a lot of frustration and a lot of things. And we're just going to have to really, you know, be listening, um, not thinking about the next thing we want to say, but hearing what the person's feeling and then making whatever adjustments we can to, to make sure that education is maximized, that people get what they need, that staff get what they need, the students, parents, guardians get what they need. Um, you know, we are given a condition through which we have to live here. The state of Connecticut will give us that. The COVID virus will naturally give us the parameters that nature will give us with respect to that. Um, and then the rest of it is us loving and listening to each other to make sure that we're being responsive. Um, that's how we get through it. And uh, some level of sacrifice will be required of everyone. Um, no matter what, what, who they are, a child will have to wear this PPE and it'll be hot sometimes. And we'll, we'll have to figure out how to make sure they're getting the breaks and, uh, you know, parents will, will be, you know, guardians will have to deal with the, the situation of being home more than they might have otherwise been. And, you know, um, teachers are going to be, you know, do, going through the great heroics that they typically you know, do every day, but they're also going to be, you know, making adjustments. So on staff. So I expect because we're, we are, and I know this is overused and I hate even uttering it, we're all in it together, but we really are. Um, we're getting through it together and uh, we're going to have to make those kinds of um, adjustments and we will. We'll love, we'll listen, and we'll respond. 
True facts. Um, okay, so a specific question. Um, the AB hybrid plan, would teaching and support staff be going in every day and students taking turns? Is that, do I have that conceptualized correctly? Um, can you repeat that again? I apologize. So the, no, it's okay. Um, the hybrid model. Yes. Um, we call so, it partial in person. Okay, sorry. <laughs> partial in person. It's the tall version of it. Come on, you know, okay. PIP. So the PIP. So the PIP. PIP, yes. Uh, yes. PIP. Um, so would that be the, um, would the teachers and staff be going into school every day and the kids would be going vice versa, like every other day kind of thing? Is that Right. Um, so the, the objective in the parcel and per partial in person plan is to minimize classroom uh, numbers. So, you know, you'd have, like I said, you'd have the A group and the B group. Um, currently, all staff, I mean, our uh, leadership are putting and creating the AB lists. Um, we are going to put out some information to ask parent guardians about siblings and what their preferences are. We'll do our best to, to um, match preferences with respect to what you know, what group the children are identified as. For instance, uh, the Willett family may want to have you know, all the children be in the A group because, you know, we want to have them all home at the same time. Whereas um, maybe another family would say, you know, please split it up for us, you know, have some of our kids in while others aren't so that we can manage, you know, who gets what resource at home. But the bottom line is that AB means splitting that population in half. So, you know, some of them are here Monday, Tuesday. Some of them are here Thursday, Friday. No one's here Wednesday. They're all online while it's cleaning. And, um, you know, it rotates so or it alternates. So that's that's the basic premise behind any kind of partial in-person. Mm -hmm. It's also known as blended, also known as hybrid. Everybody's got yep. different names. So, yep. so but uh, my question was about teaching staff. Are they there every day? Um, this teaching staff would be here every day in okay. a, in a um, except alternating, Wednesdays. except Wednesday. Yeah, exactly. That okay. day would be used, you know, to, to, again, give the virus a chance to die and to also kill it with, you know, with the cleaners. Okay. Thank you. Um, substitute teacher requirements. Um, are, are we, are you thinking about cohorting for schools? Like kind of saying, oh, this is going to be a substitute that is just going to work with the high school kids because that's obviously like a concern too, because we have to think about cohorting. Mm -hmm. um, is that just on the radar of things to think about? I'm sure it is. It is. Uh, we do have that now. Um, okay. Buildings have what's called permanent subs. We're going to be expanding that group. Um, mm -hmm. So we have that more or less now, but we'd be looking to make sure that we're adhering to it even more fastidiously. Okay, my last question. Um, I'm sure that after some more thinking and more more working with people that folks might have changed their minds or may have additional questions. Well, we know how to deal with questions, but if they want to change their minds or whatever the case may be, I'm just curious if, and I, I missed the last track meeting, I apologize, but the, it, are you gonna do another survey? Yeah, we're, we're going to be following up. Um, in fact, what we're going to be doing is we have a general idea based on survey results about who, um, you know, how many children would be online. We're going to actually set up registration. So there'll be a site that, you know, if I want my child to be online, I register my child, I put in the, um, the name, the information, um, and then I, you know, submit for each child. And we're going to actually have a registration list of the students that are online. That doesn't mean they, right now, that doesn't mean they'll be given a whole different set of classes. Um, I, don't, I don't think that many districts will have the infrastructure to have two different workforces. Um, but if we did have teachers that were working online, I would use them in support roles um, in various ways to enrich the online program. Um, but we are going to, uh, you know, we're definitely having a registration process so that we know who you know, and so parents and guardians know what to expect too, because we need a list to be able to communicate with them. Um, but um, even when the year begins, the state has made it very, very clear that a parent or guardian can opt for that at any time. Uh, we will be asking for about a week notice because we want to be able to actually make sure we're not losing, you know, stuff in the process, but um, which is about as much as a district can ask. You cannot, districts cannot say, 
uh, sure, you can be online, but you have to wait until the semester point to register. We cannot do that. Right. So, um, it, you know, teacher, parent guardians have a lot of flexibility. And just, to, you know, they give you that flexibility because they know we cannot guarantee things like six foot separation. They know that. But they also feel very strongly that the low incidences and the PPE and all that make the risk very low. Okay. Um, thank you. I think that's about it for now. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so I just had a few things. I'm gonna save um, a lot of my questions for track and I'll probably send them in a little bit earlier, Dr. Willett. Um, just a couple ideas uh, and just thinking what you were saying in response to everybody's questions. Um, I'm wondering if we can put a link to the, um, the pandemic plan page that you set up at the top, you know, just an easy banner or something at the top of each school, just so people, as soon as, you know, I'm a, I'm a kindergarten parent, if I go to Birch Grove, oh, reopening information, click that link and it'll bring me to all the information I need. I'm just thinking that would be an easier way for people to access it. Uh, just an idea. Um, another idea I was thinking in terms of uh, the Chromebooks, and how they tie into any um, online curriculum that we'll be doing. Uh, maybe we can talk talk about that in the curriculum committee in August. I don't know if Kate's done the agenda yet, but just throwing it out there as an idea. Um, another thing, and I mentioned this in track last week or the week before, um, I really would just, it would, I would find it so relieving to know that our nurses are going to have medical grade PPE. Uh, if they're if all the kids are going to be coming in there that are sick, um, I would like to see them have some medical grade masks. And that's it for me on that. And if everybody else is all set, I think we can move on to the next um, H two in the superintendent's report. Uh, Miss Plord, there is. A, it looks like Simmers up there. Did you see? I had asked before. I think she oh. forgot to take her hand out. Oh, okay. Similar, are you, Sorry about that. Do you have I, can I can take it down. Oh, no, okay. she's gone. Okay. 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 Thank you, everybody, for some great questions and Dr. Willett for some great answers. Sure. Yeah, just a note you are approaching 10 o'clock. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to go past 10. Jacob, Mari, I move that we extend the Board of Ed meeting past 10 p.m. Tony Holt, second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Uh, Chris Plord, aye. Tony? Aye. Jacob? Aye. Dana? Dana? You might be putting our kids to bed. Okay. Rini? Aye. Karen? Aye. Kate? Aye. I see Dana struggling there. I, I think she's actually here, but <laughs> I can hear you guys. Can you not hear me? We can hear you. We need an eye. Aye. <laughs> Motion passes. Okay. Now we can move on to the next agenda item. The floor is yours, Dr. Willett. Okay. So um, just a quick update on the uh, high school assistant principal, and this kind of dovetails with what we were talking about before. Um, you know, I don't know where exactly I'm going to be in another week, but um, you know, right now it looks like um, the CIAC is uh, is not going to be in a position where the sports will be at the level that they typically are. Um, as you know, we do have an opening for an assistant principal at the high school, and uh, we have an extremely um, you know extremely capable group of administrators. Um, but our, our athletic supervisor, as many of you know, and many know him, and he did receive the award a few weeks ago in front of the board. Um, the state has recognized him, excellent administrator. Um, and as I said, we have many excellent administrators. He is in a position where, um, you know, because we don't know what CIAC will be doing, um, I, I am hoping and seeking to uh, potentially move him into the role of assistant principal on an interim basis for the uh, 2021 academic year. Um, this would help provide additional funds for COVID-related adjustments that we'd be making. Um, you know, because CIAC is probably going to limit uh, the load, um, 
you know, he will have the time available to do that. And, uh, you know, he, he could also, as the year went on, um, take some of the role on as the, you know, if sports come back, he would still manage the ones that did return. And if it turned out by some huge change in what looks like is happening, um, all sports came back full on 100%. Um, you know, we do have access to some other individuals who could serve as interims to get us through the remainder of the year. But, I, um, you know, I have not heard yet one piece of information that suggested that um, as we got deeper into the year, that kind of thing would happen. In fact, most of the information I've been receiving at this point is that, you know, as we get into November and December, the opposite of that would be possibly happening. So, um, you know, I, I think at this, this point, um, that is what I am going to pursue. I just wanted to reach out to the board to make sure that, um, and, you know, you're aware of, uh, of that and that, um, you know, to get your feedback as well um, on that as we per, as we pursue it. But I think it's a good opportunity to uh, get some money. You know, uh, use that money for COVID-related things. Um, desperately need that athletic supervisor. But in this particular span of time this year, um, you know, he he will be able to absorb that role of an interim assistant principal, um, and it keeps uh, keeps the district in a good position in a number of different ways. So that's that's essentially in a nut show what I would be hoping to do. Thank you, Dr. Willett. Um, I'll go around the room again. I see Jacob's hand up. Uh, thank you, Dr. Willett, for the update. I was curious, how far along is the process for um, hiring a permanent assistant principal at this stage? So uh, we do an internal posting. There was a request uh, from the Administrative Society to extend the internal posting, which we did. Um, uh, at that point, you know, you, uh, you know, once that internal posting period, and we, you know, we did have uh, an individual that's interested. Um, you know, you talk to that that individual, and and we're pretty much at that point where we would. Um, you know, we would move forward um, with the process one way or the other. Um, and, you know, we, we would be seeking placement or at the discretion of the board doing something else. Um, so we're, we're not in a place yet where, uh, you know, where we'd be kicking anybody out of anything. There, there was no definitive uh, placement made. So this would be uh, a situation where we're moving somebody in and no one is getting kicked out. So... Uh, if we, if the board said that they were not interested in this, I would move forward with the process that we would traditionally be using. Um, but it does, again, this is a way of uh, of mitigating a lot of different challenges. Okay, I can understand that. And, and is there any um, policy regard to interim appointments for administrators? Um, you know, within the contract itself, there is language about uh, transfer and voluntary transfer, things like that. Um, so right now, uh, the there is a voluntary nature to this. So uh, the the level of complication with respect to it is probably low, but I do need to you know work through the situation and work out all the details um, and all. But uh, I, it does not appear as though there would be many. Um, you know, many adverse complications to this. It seems like it would be beneficial. Okay. Yeah, I guess my only request would be, would be kind of nice if maybe we could do like a straw poll or something real, something informal. Um, I I don't see why it wouldn't pass, but that's my only request. And I'm done, Christina. Thanks, Jacob. Rainey? Um, I just want to say that, you know, uh, Dr. Willard, I'm, I'm, I like the idea. I think it's great, um, to be able to, you know, kind of use somebody from our own, you know, staff in a, in a position like that and kind of keep them whole. And, um, you know, if, if the person has a certification and the, and the capabilities and you're confident in their, in their uh, work, I am behind that, and I I appreciate you thinking of that. It, if it frees up a little bit of um, budgetary dollars, also in a year where you know things clearly could you know go any either way at a moment's notice, I think that's an important consideration as well. So thank you for um, thinking of that, and um, I appreciate it. Thanks, Rainy Tony. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, 
you know, just to kind of agree with something Rini was saying, I could certainly see the, the benefits in this, uh, just as on the other hand, I could see benefits in, in looking uh, for another position in the, in the long term. Is the intent for this to be uh, an interim and then you would push the search when you're out or? Yes, absolutely. This is strictly interim, uh, strictly a response to the situation that we're presented with. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tony. Kate, go ahead. Tony stole my question, um, but I do want to make sure that this, um, like, d is there, is there an idea of how long it's going to be, or is it going to be for the the SY 2020 2021? The goal right now is uh, it's strictly for next this this upcoming year. It would and be uh, yeah. kind of until sports start again. Yeah, and you know, um, sports will probably be in this like on again, off again. A few of them on, not all of them on. You know that kind of thing. So yep. um, that would be the role that he would be taking on along with it. But um, you know, we don't expect there to be a full on. So we we feel it's manageable. And I just would want to make sure that we didn't say, oh, well, we squished these two positions together, this athletic director and this assistant principal, oh, so we can do it again. I, I don't want us to, to um, kind of get into that um, situation yeah. where we, we, we eliminate more administration. That is not what this district needs. Yeah, I can tell you right, as your superintendent, it, we cannot, we can't do that. That's that's not execute, executable. Um, even when you went back in history here, um, you were still paying somebody north of 100000 to do this, um, even though they weren't an administrator. So, um, you know, in that zone. So it's, it's, um, it's not something a district our size with an athletic program our size could ever do, uh, is, is to have that be how we did it all the time. It's simply that... Um, you know, we're presented with a, you know, a, a once in a hundred year pandemic sort of mm -hmm. condition that, uh, that, we, you know, we all pray and hope that is done, not, not done, done, but that is greatly mitigated by, and by the following year. And that is uh, my belief. I think we'll be able to go back to more of the typical process in the following year. Um, and then just a concern that I have um, with, with uh, two males as the um, head of the school, it's just a concern, two white males. Um, but, you know, it's because it is kind of a shorter term ex uh, situation, um, I guess, I guess, you know, it is what it is. Like I, I, I respect the um, kind of problem solving approach that you took to this, Dr. Willett. So that's really all I had to say. Thank you. Sure. Um, Jacob, did you have another question? Oh, um, I just want to say, if I wasn't there before, um, just to give direction, I, I am in favor of this um, move by Dr. Willer. That's it. Okay. Tony, how about you? Yeah, thank you. I, just one quick, Dr. Willett, and I think you touched on it a bit, but uh, if we did this move and then as the year went on, things started to change, is there a plan if the workload became too much for one person, how you would shift that off? Yeah, we, we, first of all, there's a kind of escalating um, process where uh, if these sports come on, you know, it, uh, it would be the assistant principal or interim taking on to a certain point. But if they all came on full, we have options for uh, interim people that we've used in the past. And in a worst case scenario, we would initiate any one of these interim individuals um, and get to the point where we could post it again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks, Tony. So I'll, I guess I can do what Jacob requested to do a straw poll. Um, how does that work, Dr. Willett, in this you, environment? Is it an A, I or just call everybody's name and like yep, a roll call can, vote, just a straw, straw poll? That's it. You just, instead of roll call, just straw poll and call the names as you see them, and then they can uh, say, Yep, I'm in support or not. Yeah, I mean, you can. Okay. You don't have to do the I and A. You could just say, "Yep, I support it," or "No, I don't," or "I'm on the." All right, fence. sounds good. Um, so this is for a straw poll uh, to go with Dr. Willett's recommendation um, for the upcoming year of moving the athletic director as an interim into the uh, assistant principal position at the high school. So, Jacob, I'm in favor. Kate, abstain. 
Tony. Aye. Dana. Aye. Karen. Aye. Rainey. In support. Christina Plord in support as well. All right. So thank you, Dr. Willett, for that. And thank you, everyone, for the discussion. Uh, we can move on to committee and liaison reports. I will start with, I'm just going to go on my list here. Kate, uh, if you want to up update on curriculum. We haven't met since our last board meeting. Oh, I should know that. Thank you. <laughs> Tony. Uh, we have not met, but just FYI, we are rescheduling the next one due to travel. Okay. Dana, anything on Birch Grove? First of all, Tony, please be safe in your travels. I read your email last night and it was quite concerning <laughs> that you're Thank traveling you. so far away. So please be safe. I appreciate um, that, Dana. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, we had our meeting last night. Um, the construction is progressing really well. Um, we're still running on time for substantial completion for August 23rd, 2021. So that's fantastic. Um, they did do a virtual tour last night at our meeting. Um, so not only did they have blueprints, but they had um, a version of a virtual tour. Uh, and Dr. Willett is going to post that on the Birch Grove Project website. So um, people should go online and look at it. It's already up there, Dr. Willett? It is. Uh, it's in. When you click on it, there's a series of different documents. So it's going to be okay. the most recent one. It'll be 2020, uh, 721 or something like that. Okay. It's uh, what they showed last night was incredible. So please take a peek if you have a moment. Um, also, um, if you are following the superintendent's um, Facebook page, Dr. Wallet has been posting videos um, that they've been showing from the ground floor uh, from Demaria and such. So uh, other than that, nothing else to say. Uh, there will be the topping off ceremony that we talked about at last uh a couple board event meetings ago um, that we will announce uh, sometime in August. Um, they're kind of waiting for the progress of the steel to set that date, but it will be in August at some point. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. Karen, anything for communications and town council? Communications has not met um, since our last board meeting and um, town council is coming up next week, I believe. Okay. And I think that's it. Did I miss anyone? I know Griffin's not here. Um, actually, I did have one question. Rini, as the negotiations chair, I know you guys haven't met. Uh, so I guess this is probably more for Walt. Are we going to have negotiations meet for any MOUs uh, for the upcoming reopening? Um, I'll, I'll be talking mostly to uh, uh, Rainey about them. Um, okay. I can do whatever you want, certainly. But, uh, you know, um, some of that, that process... Um, it is a little bit more straightforward than a full all, full all on bargaining situation. So we will probably be working rapidly and using uh, Shipwin and Goodwin as uh, one of our main resources. So happy to include anybody, but um, I was thinking, you know, Rainy and I would be talking and, and whatever Rainy ultimately wanted to do. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Okay. So um, I do not have a chairperson's report, so um, I will entertain a motion to enter into executive session um, for the purpose of the superintendent evaluation. So Ms. Plur, did you move that to the to the end of or did No, it wasn't. No, no, moved. that's right. Okay. So what Let's I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and put everybody in the waiting room that's not a board member, just so you know. When okay. when you pass that or if you pass that, I'm going to move everybody who's not a board member into the waiting room and anybody who is in the waiting room if you hang out there as soon as we come out of executive session, um, then you will be let back in. And just anyone that's on right now, um, the public participation is still on the agenda after the executive session. Um, we'd love to hear from you, but if, if you don't want to stay up that late, we're happy to uh, receive any emails or, or phone calls with your questions. So thank you for attending. I'm moving. So now I'll entertain a motion. <laughs> Rini B. saw and make a motion that we enter into executive session. Uh, point of information: Are, are we including or inviting Dr. Willett in the motion, or is that yes, it? yes? Need a second. Jacob Mars, second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Any opposed, say nay. Christina Plord, aye. 
Jacob? Aye. Kate? Aye. Tony? Aye. Dana? Aye. Karen? Aye. Rini? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, so there's 74 people. Uh, it'll take me a, a uh, you know a, a minute or two to get everybody in the waiting room. Um, okay. so, I'll, so I'm going to start that process now. Okay. 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 If all board members could lower their hands, <coughs> and now we'll move on to public participation. If anyone is still out there and would like to speak to the board. Steve Jones, go ahead, you have two minutes. All right, I'll try and be fast. Um, so just wanna say great job, Dr. Willett, with that document. You know, it's gonna be a lot to go over and probably provide a high level summary to the council next week. I just had four questions, but in the interest of time, I don't want that to be answered tonight. Um, you can email me back at the council email if you prefer. Um, the first question is how the school library usage will be maintained or regulated. Will it be a similar fashion to what the town is doing in terms of quarantining um, items and how that's going to work out in terms of students that want to utilize the books and other materials. Uh, the second question is if there's going to be any additional or um, kind of uh, reinforced emotional mental health tools or aids for students, you know, kind of going through this really new situation, what resources will be available to them. And then in tandem with that, uh, is there going to be any eventual summer reading or kind of guidance, like a high, even a more simpler level or higher level of what this 77 page plan is that will be provided both to students at various grade levels for reading as well as their parents? And finally, um, how does the current program affect students through open choice? I was curious if that means they have to go specifically through only online education if they're from other towns or if they still have the opportunity to go to the school system uh, in person. So I think that summarizes the questions. Again, great job to everyone. You know, keep up the hard work, getting closer to the start of the school year. As a non-parent, you know, I'm equally concerned and want to make sure students and teachers are safe and appreciate all the due diligence you've been doing. Thank you. And sorry, my address is 514 Old Stafford Road for, the, for Lisa's record. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Bethany Lesko. You're on mute if you're out there. Yep, I'm here. Uh, Bethany Lesko, 26 Deer Meadow. Uh, this might come across as aggressive to some, but I feel that this is for those that need to hear this bluntly, whether silent listeners or those who are reading this after the fact. To those who do not respect and support the work and dedication that Dr. Willett and our Board of Education has done to work within these trying times to protect our children and staff, then there are other towns in Connecticut that can welcome you and others who can buy into your needs. Dr. Willett has given everything to this. If you cannot tell by the almost daily updates, then I suggest you consider moving. If you put this problematic situation into terms of sports, Dr. Willett can throw up a Hail Mary and the town of Holland residents will still find fault. There is not a perfect answer or a solution. I commend you, Dr. Willett, the Board of Education, good, bad, and different, I commend you. Also of consideration, if the Board of Education could find or figure out a better earlier time to make this three-hour meeting more accessible to all, whether Zoom in the future, et cetera, I think you would see more interest. I think as Dr. Willett mentioned a couple hours ago, uh, if we could listen to each other, live, love, have compassion, and remember, we are all in this together, despite all of our own opinions. Please be kind to one each other. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Bethany. Colleen. Can you hear me, Christina? Yes, we can hear you. I don't know why. I have my picture off, and I wave like you guys can see me. So, <laughs> um, Colleen Udachek, 12 Blueberry Hill. Um, just have a couple questions, um, Dr. Willett. I was just wondering, how will the snow days work now? Will the kids be able to learn at home instead of um, losing those days? Um, that's one. And then another question was, uh, face shields, it wasn't really, I wasn't really, really clear on it. Um, are face shields required all day long? Um, and then earlier in the week, I saw an article come out um, that the state 
the teachers union is the teachers association is, has their own list of concerns um, are you worried about that or is the state worried about that and i was just wondering did i miss a vote on dr willett's evaluation i would assume it should be done by now um, he's an outstanding leader and the longer this goes on i'm concerned that um something's going to happen and we're going to lose an outstanding superintendent that's it okay thanks colleen uh liz costa Hello, everyone. First of all, thanks for um, coming back out of executive session. Appreciate it. Thanks to everyone for the hard work on the track and for Dr. Willett. Um, I, you know, I think in general, uh, a lot of care and concern and this, what he put together on the track and the administrators and all the teachers put together isn't going to work for everyone. It's not going to work for every teacher. It's not going to work for every parent. It's not going to work for every child. But I think the care and concern that went into this is outstanding. And I appreciate the fluidity and the ability to change on the fly. So I just want to say thank you to everyone, especially Dr. Willett. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any more blue hands. So I'm going to move on to points of information. Uh, does any board member wish to speak? You can raise your hands. No. Nope. Dr. Willett, do you want to answer Colleen's questions? Sure. Um, so snow days, you know, um, you know, essentially, if uh, if we were in a pandemic condition that you know was online or whatever, we would continue online work. It may be in the future that you know we could uh, have a day that is an inclement weather day where people could work from home. We'll just have to see how this situation has evolved, how we can handle those. Um, sometimes, um, you know, people feel like those traditionally snow days have been days that they they you know have a lot of other things to deal with and they don't necessarily want schooling to continue. So, you know, we would just have to see what the community feels about that overall. Um, but eventually, you know, we could. We could actually uh, have children work from home on snow days. It is definitely something that can happen. We, we have those kinds of resources now to do it. So it would be more what people are feeling on that than anything else. Face shields are not at all required all day. No. Um, but, uh, you know, what they are is... Um, they be in the kids' backpacks. While the children are listening to someone, you know, that's farther in the classroom talk, they could be there with their PPE face mask. Um, but if they have to work together in close proximity or close proximity work with a teacher, that's when the shield, face shield would be added. Um, so it's another layer of uh, protection. If a, if a child is working in a science lab, for instance, and they're working with a partner, they may put on their shield. But if they're sitting listening to the teacher, the face mask uh, may be sufficient. So the shields are not meant to be worn all the time, but they're an, another layer that every single student would have. Um, they also help us because there's kind of this whole plexiglass sort of craze going on right now. And plexiglass is very expensive. Um, it does not provide a higher level of protection um, in some situations. And by the, you know, at the end of this uh, 2021 year, we don't want to have so much plexiglass left over that, you know, we could build a, an aquarium bigger than Boston. So we want to make sure that we you know, don't end up wasting money or resources either, um, especially when there's no added benefit to protection. So that's what these um, face shields give us the flexibility of, is using them in the, under the conditions where they're needed, um, and then having the kids put them in their backpacks like a calculator when um, when they're not um, not needed. So um, no, not at all. Um, and teachers union has their own list of concerns. They do. Uh, I think there was a article in the mirror on it. Um, there's a number of, uh, you know, people talking about that right now. So, you know, I, I work in partnership with teachers. Um, they're, they are, again, I, you know, they are, um, they're on the, they're in the classrooms. I want them to have the, the ability to serve the kids. And one of my jobs is supporting them. So I anticipate that, you know, as we talk to bargaining units, we're going to make it all work out. And, um, you know, I'm committed to them and they're committed to the children and, and we're all committed to each other, so we're going to make it work. Um, and uh, the evaluation process for superintendent is, is coming into a, you know, an endpoint here. Uh, I thank the board um, for all they've done. Uh, we have a one, you know, I'm very thankful for uh, the 
process in them and um, and we'll be wrapping that up probably in the next meeting um, when they do their final uh, voting on contract and things like that. So that's coming into a close now. And I think that was all of them from Ms. Uh, Ms. Udicek. Mr. Jones, I will, uh, I'll give you those uh, later if you'd like, as you asked, uh, I'll provide you some. But generally, yes, we have lots of mental health resources working on, summer guidance we're looking to put out, and open choice would still be involved. Open choice would still be happening. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> All right, if nobody else has any points of information. I have um, something, Ms. Plourd, real quick, if you don't mind. Go for um, it. I, thank you. Just raise my hand. Um, Ms. Lasko, thank you for your feedback on Dr. Willett, um, Ms. Casa, and um, Colleen um, Udicek. Thank you very much for all your feedback. Um, I would challenge you folks to please go to the track website and and look at, um, you know, follow the opening committee, um, you know, that you get um, Dr. Willett superintendent bulletins each time. And please don't hesitate to email any questions or concerns or positive feelings or negative feelings to the Board of Education. Um, and we definitely appreciate you all hanging on this long tonight to let us know about your feedback uh, about Dr. Willett. And um, thank you very much. Yes, I, allow me to say too. Thank you. We you know, deeply appreciate the support. It means a lot to me. It means more than uh, more than you know. So thank you for for the kind words that that uh, people have been saying. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dr. Willett, and thank you everyone that stayed on to get up and speak. Uh, with that, we'll go on to future. I think we have enough on there, and Dr. Willett kind of um, reviewed what was going to be on the August agenda. Um, no new business, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Rainy Besaw, make a motion to adjourn. Kate Howard Founder, second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Christina Plourd, aye. Jacob? Aye. Kate? Aye. Tony? He's muted, but he said Tony, aye. you're muted. <laughs> aye. aye. Dana? Aye. Karen? Aye. Rainey? Aye. Motion passes. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Safe travels, Tony. Uh, take Thanks, care. Guys. Thank you.